Okay, Ms. Marshall, you are the co-host of this meeting. We are recording. It is 6.35. We have a full board with us tonight and the attendees are coming. I think you're good to go. All right, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of September 18th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.35 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of hard economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Colden. I am here. Fred Hartwell. I am here. Lawrence Klutz. I am here. Jesse Major. Present. Uh, I, Doug Marshall, am present. Johanna Newman. Present. And Karin Winter. Present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment, and I will call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public co comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you've joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so time now is 6.38. I wanna start uh, with a, just a comment that's off of the uh, agenda and just say welcome to Lawrence Klutz. Uh, I can't remember whether it was May or June when I sat in interviews with you for uh, both of us to be appointed to the planning board, but uh, it's great to finally have you on board and uh, have a full complement of people who are going to be with us for the next year. So welcome. Thank you, Doug. It's it's really a pleasure to be here. Okay, so the first item on our published agenda is a review and approval of minutes. Uh, tonight, we have minutes for September 4th. And they were distributed in our packet. Uh, board members, are there any comments on these draft minutes? Bruce. Um, Jesse, you might uh, check me on this, but uh, on page five, uh, 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 item 10, X, well, X, Roman numeral X, uh, number two, the it reports on the housing subcommittee's deliberations and and it says that we were uh, working to define rental housing um there should be the word student 
in front of rental housing. We were, uh, particularly, we were, uh, we are calling, we were calling it a student home. We wanted to define the student home. And I think the minute should reflect that rather than the more general rental housing. All right, uh, Jesse. Yeah, I agree. I was going to point that out as well. All right. <clears throat> so, Chris or Pam, if you can add that word to the uh, record. Got it. Jesse, your hand is it still up? Okay, not a comment. Are there other comments on the minutes? Bruce. Uh, move to adopt the, approve the minutes uh, as uh, amended. All right. Uh, Jesse, you got your hand up next. I'll second that. Okay. Next time, better luck next time, Johanna. All right. We have a motion to adopt and a second. Uh, last call for minute for comments. Anybody want to say anything else? All right. We will go through a roll call on the minutes. Same order. Bruce. I approve. Fred. I approve. And then Jesse. I approve. I will approve. Uh, Lawrence. I approve. Very well. Johanna? I approve. And Karen? I approve. All right. Thank you all. All right. Next item now at 641 is public comment. Um, at this time, it's been our habit to read the names of the public uh, attendees that we can that I can see uh, on the screen. Uh, this is predominantly to benefit the attendees so they know who else is in the room since they uh, can't see that. So at this point we have nine attendees and they are Barry Roberts, Chris Chamberland of Berkshire Design, Gail Flood, James Gruber from Wayfinders, Jesse Selman, Jonathan Salvan, Philip Henry, Rachel Belanger, Seth Wilschitz, Wil Wilschitz, and Tom Reedy. And I know that a number of those people are here for the hearings and discussion that's coming later. So not very many members of the public. However, if any of you would like to make a comment at this time, please raise your hand. I will give you a few seconds to think about it and then we'll move on. All right, I do not see any hands raised or public comment. All right, we will move on to item three on the agenda which is a public hearing. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested, interested citizens to be heard uh, regarding SPR 2024-11, uh, U Drive Amity, LLC, University Drive at Amity Street. This is continued from August 7th, 2024. And uh, I was supposed to read the time at the beginning of this. So the time now is 644. I would guess that it, I started at 643. Uh, so the applicant is requesting a site plan review approval under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw to redevelop existing commercial space into an 85 unit residential, any 85 residential unit and commercial space mixed use development, including parking, landscape, lighting, and stormwater infrastructure. Uh, the parcels are 13B, 18, 27, and 28, and 54 in the BL zoning district. 
All right, this is continued from August 7th when we had a very brief opening of the hearing at which point the applicant requested that this be postponed or continued to a later date, which we have done and that thus we are here tonight. So uh, welcome Tom Reedy and Barry Roberts. Uh, I, if there's anybody else from your team you'd like to be have brought over. Um, I will say at the outlet set that it's my understanding that you have not uh, really entered into discussion with the Conservation Commission yet. So we do not expect to close this hearing tonight. We expect to continue it to a later date once you've gotten some input from them. So tonight we're hoping you can make your opening presentation of the project and we'll all hear it. We'll have time for a few questions from the board and maybe from the public if any uh, public want to comment or ask questions. And then we will continue the hearing to a later date. We do have a couple of uh, substantive topics later on the agenda tonight. So if we're able to get through this in 45 minutes or so, that would be ideal. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson uh, out of Amherst here on behalf of U Drive Amity uh, with actually, me this actually, evening. Tom, Tom, let me break. Uh, I should have asked, are there any board member disclosures? To, if I didn't ask that already. Anybody have a disclosure they want to uh, publicize? Okay. All right. I didn't think so. So thank you, Tom. Sure. Uh, of course. Uh, Pam, if you could bring in Jonathan Salvon and mm -hmm. Bill Henry, please. Sure. And then uh, maybe just a little off script, but I don't know if this is the last time I'll be in front of Miss Breaststrup. And if so, no. I just wanted to thank her uh, for all she's done for planning and development in, in Amherst. Uh, we are lucky to have had you. Um, it's a big hole to fill. You've left a lasting legacy, and I hope you know how proud we are to have had you in the role you're in. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so sorry for the, I just don't know if I'm going to get to that at the end. Um, okay. okay, so uh, with me this evening, Barry Roberts, manager of U-Drive Amity, uh, Jonathan Salvon, principal over at Kuhn Riddle Architects, the, the designer, the architect on this project, and then Phil Henry from Civil Design Group, who is the site designer here. Um, by way of a little bit of context, these folks, this development team also developed University Drive South, one University Drive South. 70 University Drive, 40 University Drive, 180 Fearing Street, and then most recently the approval of 4555 South Pleasant Street. So a little bit of a pedigree in town, not even to speak to Mr. Roberts and the pedigree he has with his projects uh, in the Commonwealth in Western Massachusetts and specifically in, in Amherst. Um, I think what, what we'll do, Mr. Chair, I, I hear you exactly. I was going to make the same pitch that we know we're getting continued. We're going to be in front of the, the Conservation Commission. We're finishing up the notice of intent. Um, we have had, uh, Phil and I had a very productive discussions with Aaron Jock, the conservation agent. Uh, we are on the cusp of submitting that NOI. If it's not by Friday, it'll be first of the week. The plan that you have in front of you in its latest iteration embodies those uh, the, the results of the discussions with Aaron. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit more detail uh, when we get into the, the site plan, but um, we will be in front of them. We also understand that there's a, an overlay district being proposed for uh, University Drive generally, but this site uh, particularly, uh, which would allow additional density here. And we are very supportive of that. Um, how that uh, the results of that and whether or not it happens is, is if it happens, period, if it happens as part of this while this is pending, uh, we hope that it does in fact happen and that we'll either still be in process and be able to, to pivot. We, we've designed the site, frankly, uh, which would be compliant with um, that updated overlay. A couple of little tweaks, but no, nothing major. Uh, and then we can decide in the future how to actually handle that, whether we have approval or not. So we see this as you do as a, a process, and this is just the opening salvo, if you will. And so... How we're here is the overlay district isn't in place yet, but we do have uh, a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals that we received earlier this year. I wanna say it was in, in March, I believe, 
that allowed us additional density. Um, this uh, is a aggregate of four sites, which totals 5.31 acres, and I'll show it on the map in a moment, uh, about 231,000 square feet. Those variants allowed us to have up to 85 residential units uh, to go up to 57 feet in height and to have up to five stories. As I mentioned, the overlay would allow a, a bit more density in the form of a, a sixth story. Uh, in fact, we do have designs for that already, so hopefully we get to show you those at some point. Um, what I think I'd like to do is just, I think most folks are probably familiar with the site, but I'm going to orient everyone with the site. If you can see my screen, you've got um, University Drive um, shown north, south, Amity Street, east, west. Town of Hadley is on the left to the west. And then downtown Amherst is, is to the right or the east. You've got 422 Amity Street, which is right here. And you've got 2535 University Drive right here. This lot, this lot, this lot, and this lot. Uh, in the aggregate total, that 5.31 uh, acres that uh, are the subject parcel, if you will, we would go through and, and request as a condition of approval that prior to the receipt of a building permit that the lots be combined via a perimeter plan. Uh, an ANR plan is is certainly suitable for that. Um, I'll zoom out just a little bit to give you a little bit more context, which again, I think everybody knows Route 9 is to the south. You've got, you know, the, the big Y CVS Plaza here. You've got um, 70 University Drive, 40 University Drive, uh, the, the hangar here. And you've got the University Football Stadium and then the University proper to the north. To the east is uh, downtown Amherst. I will show if you've seen the change of screen, just a street view of what it looks like currently. This is at the intersection of University Drive and, and Amity Street, North University Drive and University Drive. This is um, the existing, I think when it was taken, it was probably rafters. It's been updated to be Pleasantries, which is a was approved as a, a marijuana establishment, but that has not been operational for quite some time. Um, but you'll, you'll see... Uh, here, we there is a sidewalk and there are existing street trees. I think what I'll do now is I'm just going to show the overlay of what exists and what we're proposing so you get a sense of what, what that is. And so if you can see my screen here, what we've got, uh, Amity Street uh, is to, this is the north to the right, University Drive is down here, the blue underneath is existing. So this is your existing 422 Amity Street where pleasantries and formerly rafters existed. And then this is 2535 University Drive. Uh, as the chair mentioned, we are proposing 85 total units over two buildings. Um, there would be 259 beds in this iteration. Um, we've got between uh, 10,000 and 14,000 square feet of commercial space and, and why it fluctuates is it depends whether we use any of the second floor spaces in the buildings for commercial or office space. Um, we, we'd like to have that option. We don't know, you know, whether or not we'd actually utilize that space. It's, I think it would be based on uh, tenancy. And so the northerly building would have 49 units. The southerly building would have 36 units. Of those 85 units, we would propose 12% affordable, which results in about 10 units or in 10 units qualified on the subsidized housing inventory. We would be proposing 186 parking spaces. Uh, I believe 72 of those are covered spaces, which I'll show you uh, next. And I'm sure Jonathan will talk about a little bit. And then 114 are open air spaces. You can see that what we're trying to do is really utilize the existing development. This blue line, as I said, is existing. And so you can see we are going a little bit beyond uh, in a few areas. I think it totals um, existing impervious surface on site is about 94,000 square feet. We would be looking to have a proposed impervious area of about 103,000 square feet. So it's an increase of about about 9,389 
square feet, which, you know, on a site this large, I think the designers, kudos to Phil and, and Jonathan uh, for for you re, uh, utilizing what's existing. Um, and if you were at any of the site visits, we've held two of them. You, I think, got a sense of that redevelopment or, or reutilization. There's significant wetlands on site, but we're not disturbing any of the wetlands. This is going to be a buffer zone only project. Um, there's 96,000 square feet of existing buffer zone on site. Currently, there's 60,000 square feet being disturbed. We are looking, we are proposing to increase that disturbance by 9,000 square feet. So kind of the same as the impervious surface is what the disturbance of the uh, buffer zone is going to be. I'll show you a landscape plan in a little bit. Um, we are proposing 3.25 to one mitigation. So for every square foot of additional buffer zone disturbance, we're proposing three and a quarter square feet of mitigation. And, and it's just for that excess, for that additional uh, square footage. I will show you the site plan. And if at any point, and I forgot to say it, stop me, ask questions. I'm gonna give you the high level view. We've got uh, Phil to answer any questions. I'm gonna put on my engineer's head and talk about as much as I can. Then I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan to talk about the architecture. Then we can come back to management somewhat high level because I think to a certain extent, you all know Barry and he's gonna be the one managing this project. So I will share my site plan. So you've got uh, the existing uh, overlay here. One of the things I neglected to mention earlier is that there is in the works uh, a mass works grant that the town has applied for uh, with support, I think, from UMass, as well as the applicant. We've written a letter of support. I know that the undersecretary of, of the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities is coming out in October, and this is going to be one of the stops that they're going to make uh, to review this project. And, and hopefully to help in the acquisition of that MassWorks grant. That grant would help to, to place this roundabout uh, in lieu of the signalized intersection. Existing condition plan. Uh, this was part of that overlay that you saw. One of the things I didn't mention is, and I'll show you this later, but we're trying to utilize the existing detention basin, which exists here on the site. Um, demolition plan. Uh, the the idea at this point is to phase this project to, to be in two phases where we take down uh, strike that we put the exist we put the stormwater in uh, we put the sediment control measures in to ensure that we're not silting up the newly placed stormwater infrastructure then we take down 422 build this north building um, there has been an offer to existing tenants to, if they want to relocate from the 2535 building to this new building, they can obviously negotiating aside. And then once this building, that North building has been created to take down 2535 and to put that Southerly building there. So right now that it's contemplated to have a phased approach, uh, we would appreciate if that wasn't a condition, just if something changed, whether the tenants don't want to move or, uh, you know, Barry, in reflection on construction, realizes it may be better, more advantageous to construct all at once. Right now, it's planned to be phased, but we just wouldn't want that to be a condition uh, of the approval. Here's the proposal. As I mentioned, you've got that north building. You've got that south building. Uh, you've got the roundabout proposed here. The north building is tucked to the uh, setback line. Uh, you've got the parking behind as much as possible. There's some parking in this area, and I'll zoom in just a little bit so you can see. Uh, there's some parking in this area here for the commercial tenants so that there's a, a ease of accessibility. Uh, this, as Jonathan will show you, is five stories. This is four stories. Again, four stories here, five stories in the back. This will be uh, first floor of... The covered parking, same thing here, first floor covered parking, and then four stories of residential above, four stories of residential above, 186 parking spaces in total. We're proposing a porous pavement back here in the sensitive 
uh, buffer zone area as it's nearest to the wetlands. We are proposing to close both existing curb cuts at the 422 site, uh, the existing curb cut it, that's for the 2535 site technically is being pushed further west, remaining full access. We are asking for uh, another curb cut full access here and then an exit only curb cut here. I'll, I'll pause to just note that there is currently a restriction held by the town on University Drive where historically it was no more than I believe six curb cuts could have existed. In 2017 spring town meeting, Barry went in front of town meeting and received overwhelming support for the relaxation of that restriction to allow him to you to have another curb cut into 70 University Drive. The reason for that restriction altogether was the earlier contemplation that University Drive would be what's called a limited access highway. And so the idea was to, as it sounds, limit access. Uh, that uh, didn't bear fruit and 116 was created. And so that limited access ness sort of became vestigial. And so I've, I've been talking with the assistant town manager about whether we're gonna go to the town council who is the keeper of the ways to just allow these two access points or if the town wants to release that restriction altogether. I know Ms. Brestrup has mentioned that in her development application report. So that is an ongoing process. As Ms. Brestrup notes, you may need to opine at some point. Um, one way or the other, we would appreciate support for the at least these um, curb cuts. You'll see that, like I said, full access, full access. And this one over here is exit only. It, it serves two purposes. One is uh, site circulation around the entirety of this building, particularly for fire purposes, and also to allow a use here that might have a drive through. Our traffic engineer looked at it and went worst case scenario with a coffee shop. It could be a bank or any other drive through use that, that you could think of. Uh, we've also pulled the buildings up. I think they're 22 uh, feet off of the property line in some areas. We've got a six foot wide sidewalk here. I know the, the overlay district contemplates 10, which we would be able to achieve. Uh, there's also an existing sidewalk that's um, so the, the proposed sidewalk and the new sidewalk, you know, we're happy to take suggestions. This is somewhat mirrors the other side of University Drive where there are in some places two sidewalks um, and in between those two sidewalks are those existing street trees. So whether it's combining them and removing those street trees or leaving the six foot plus the existing or widening this to, to 10 feet plus the existing, we're happy to take feedback there. What this also does is it eliminates that internal uh, access way. And so that, that road that is parallel to University Drive, which was done because of the restriction would go away and these buildings would be um, pulled up in that area. This is the grading and drainage plan. Again, we are uh, keeping the drainage basin. We're enlarging it. Um, and this is really low impact development. You've got the drain lines within the parking lot. You've got a proprietary receptor to meet uh, stormwater standards. And then the discharge point into the detention basin, you've got clean roof water, which is being discharged into the detention basins as well. They're not infiltration, they're detention. Um, and what we're doing is utilizing what's existing out there. One of the things that Aaron had asked for was for Phil, the engineer, to uh, meet the NOAA 14 plus standards, which is like, it, it's frankly not even, um, law at this point. DEP is looking to implement the, the NOAA 14 plus as the standard, as is the town through their new stormwater regulations, which haven't been, to my knowledge, uh, effectuated yet. We've designed it to those standards and this meets the standard. So we are able to meet the stormwater standards, standards and reduce what we need to reduce uh, on the site using the more I'll say aggressive standards of the NOAA 14 plus. Um, utility plan, I don't know that that folks will necessarily care about that. We can get into the details. I'm just gonna skip down to the landscaping plan because I think that's uh, material. 
we've got that's buffer zone on site. So here's the landscaping plan. You'll see that we've got mitigation proposed over here uh, with a with a legend to how we're proposing the mitigation. We've got essentially, uh, let's see, 770 plus or minus new plantings um, made up of trees, shrubs, perennials, and then just um, different uh, wetland buffer plantings, winterberry, white oak, um, Nani berry, et cetera. So this is that that landscape plan that uh, you didn't have in the early iteration, but you've you've got this, and this is what we're going to be proposing to the Conservation Commission as well. I am going to switch over to lighting just to bring you. And I'll first show you Kuhn Riddle's plan. And then what I can do is show you the photometric plan just so you can see the, the number of fixtures um, and the lumens that they kick off. So here is the lighting plan. And so what we've got here, lighting plan, there are, and I think Ms. Bresher Printer Development Application Report called it out. You know, there's, there's four, I'll call them different types of lighting. Um, there's the, uh, the the canopy lighting. You know, these are all the A's, 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 and they're really at all of those indentations in the access points. There are parking lot lights uh, throughout the parking lot and along the public way. The ones internal, and I'll show you them in a minute, are 18 feet proposed. The ones uh, along the right of way are uh, 12 feet proposed. And then we've got some wall packs as well. And then on the signage, which we would accept the condition of approval to come back, and we may even have it by the time we're ultimately approved. Uh, we were proposing signage on this. It's proposed to be just a small stone knee wall, I'll call it. And so let me show you the photometric plan. Okay. All right, so this is the photometric plan. It's probably best if I do... Scroll in a little bit. So you'll see at the property line, no light bleed. You've got a well illuminated entryways. You've got well illuminated public ways, well illuminated parking spaces. So this is where you'll see, you know, B2. I'm actually, I'm not going to take your time to go through the, the fixtures. If you want to take a look, by all means, take a look. These are the taller ones. I, I believe they're doubles. And then you've got the smaller, shorter 12 foot uh, along the, the frontage here. And then you see this is, you know, it's all wetlands here. Um, and we've got uh, the necessary lighting. We haven't heard back from DPW yet. If, if they want additional lighting, if the planning board wants additional lighting, you know, as you know, we're trying to find that balance of providing enough without providing too much. And then I'll just talk about traffic and then turn it over to Jonathan. So we had uh, Stantec uh, do a traffic impact memo. Uh, somewhat summarily, what they determined was that the proposed uses would increase traffic in the morning by 0.8% in that peak hour in the morning. And then in the afternoon by, I think it's 4.6% in the afternoon, which is... I, I'll make a characterization relatively minimal, um, especially for this area. And that's based upon the existing signalized intersection design. Everybody is hopeful that uh, the funds do come through for the roundabout. And with that roundabout, that traffic will flow um, much better. If any of I mean, the folks that were there today at the site visit, and I think folks who have been there before, whether for a site visit or otherwise, uh, there's a lot of people that use this as a cut through so that they can avoid the light. Hopefully that roundabout, you know, um, not only with the, the location of the building and closing those curb cuts will prevent that, but also the roundabout will allow the better flow of traffic. I'll pause there. I know I threw a lot at you, uh, hopefully somewhat comprehensively. I'm happy to talk site, traffic, lighting, landscaping. Otherwise I can uh, put it over and show the architecture for Jonathan and then we can come back and talk about management a little bit. 
Uh, Tom, given that we're predominantly going to listen to you tonight, uh, and we'll have maybe a few questions and then we'll move on. Why don't you go ahead with Jonathan? Sounds great. Okay. Sorry, too many screens at the time of the mute button. Good evening. Um, I'm done a really great job. It hasn't really left me too much uh, to discuss tonight, but um, you know, we're starting here with a kind of an image um, of the site from above. Um, and in this image, uh, University Drive is, uh, Tom, can you, yeah, there you go. I'm trying to use my mouse and that's really not gonna do it. <laughs> um, University Drive's kind of, uh, you know, right in front of us on the page and Amity Street kind of turns around the corner there. Um, and, you know, these, as Tom said, we've been continuing to work on this. You know, these these images um, don't have all the plantings that are in the planting plan yet, but we do have updated ones that do. Um, and it, whether that's tonight or another night, we can we can walk you through those. Uh, but conceptually, as as everyone kind of knows, most of the development on the street right now um, is set back from the street with parking in front. Um, and we felt this was a great opportunity to kind of uh, change that that dynamic and, and begin to create a little bit of a street facade and a street um, wall and put the parking behind. Um, and so as, as Tom has discussed, we've we've could kind of lined the street with the with our new buildings that start at four stories um, along University Drive and then step up at the back of the site and along um, Amity Street to five stories. Um, maybe we go to the next slide. There we go. So these are some views, you know, at street level from a couple of different angles up on the top uh, left is, you know, assuming that roundabout gets built, we're sort of standing in the middle of that roundabout looking at the corner um, with the uh, the larger, the north building kind of right in front of us. And then distantly behind those street trees, you can catch a bit of the, the, the south building. Uh, to the right, the image that is a view, not quite to the Hadley line, but pretty close kind of looking uh, back at the north building um, with the south building um, behind it and some of the parking. And then the lower uh, left, we have the view uh, in from the north looking towards the south, towards the university um, where we can see the, the south building uh, from the street, see how it steps back from, from or steps up from four to five stories. You can get a you can get a sense of that second curb cut coming in there, um, and then the last image on this sheet is uh, in our parking area at the back of the site in the kind of a, the southwest corner. Um, you know, seeing the, the the space we're able to create and and how you know, how much parking we're actually screening as as, as part of that. Um, before we move to the next one, Tom, let me just quickly point out the different materials that that we've been thinking about using the. We're looking at uh, using some brick uh, up to about the, the the fourth floor level. We had both a uh, kind of a combination of both a brick, you know, traditional brick tone and maybe a tan, and then that gray material uh, that we're using as kind of an accent in, in several places. That's that's envisioned as sort of a metal uh, panel product. And if we scroll down to the next one, um, I'll try not to repeat too much of what Tom's kind of talked about, but I will talk a little bit about the covered parking. Um, we've got uh, two uh, covered parking bays, one on each building. Uh, you know, they're double loaded, about 60 feet wide internal. Um, and, you know, they, that's where some of the accessible parking will be. There will also be accessible parking kind of on the, the outside parking. Um, but both of those uh, parking bays then lead you into a, a lobby and elevator core uh, that will connect up to the residential floors above. Um, and then again, along Amity Street, we have uh, the non-residential uh, uses, whether those are retail or office or some sort of business use. That's the sort of pink and, and light blue tones. And we can scroll up to some of our typical floors. So Tom, I if you can kind of point out the the elevators, if you can, there's both both buildings. Kind of, it's kind of hard. Uh, have an elevator core that will serve 
the floors. Uh, we have a mixture of units, uh, you know, from some ones and twos uh, all the way up to four bedrooms. There, I don't think we in the current version have any studios. I think we we have moved away from those for the most part. Um, and then scroll down just a little bit more, you can see that we're, we're kind of leaving ourselves the option to have some second floor office space if, if it makes um, sense to be able to rent it out. We also have other versions of this plan that are, are all residential from the, the second floor up. These will be uh, what are called podium buildings. So the, the upper parts will be uh, likely to be wood frame construction, but the first floor construction will be steel and concrete. Um, as as is commonly done, I'm sure people have seen being constructed here in town. Now let's move up to to one of the floors. We can begin to see the stepping back. I think because really two and level two and three are pretty much the same. Yeah, oh, but we have, there we go. So this is now the the fifth floor, as you can see that we we really do substantially sort of set back from the street, um, and it does give us some opportunities to possibly have some units that have some small outdoor terraces associated with them. Although most of the roof space will be uh, taken up by mechanical equipment, especially at the very top level. I think, I think maybe, Jonathan, maybe one thing to mention is just the size of the units. You know, the planning board, as you're reviewing the plans, they're, they're sizable units. Yes. You, know, you, you look at the four bedrooms and they're 1,500 to 1,600 square feet. Um, you know, two bedrooms, eleven hundred plus square feet. So they're they're a good size um, unit. Yeah, if you, if you zoom in a little bit, that that information is on these sheets. Yep. If people are interested, and so again, um, we're looking at a combination of materials, uh, maybe up to two colors of brick. Um, on the, the portions of the facade that kind of step forward toward the street, and then on the portions that kind of step back from the street, uh, we're thinking a, a sort of a metal panel siding. And that's just, that's the- yep. uh, That's the same uh, lighting, lighting plan. plan. Yeah, and I'll, let me just show one more. Jonathan, because I think this is pretty. Yeah, I don't know if you have the up, the more up to date. Well, what I this oh, one is yeah. what I was hoping to show is, and if you want to describe where it is. So this is one of the this is one of the fifth floor units um, that will, would have a, a terrace associated with it. But um, this is you know aesthetically what we're hoping to do when when it comes to the quality of the units. Um, you know, we're we're using a fairly large window area to provide a lot of natural light um, and provide a nice modern, um, you know, uh, apartment space. Okay. Um, management, just quickly. So this is uh, Barry Roberts. He's going to be managing the property. We've, you know, we've got your, man we got the management plan. <laughs> Simply, if you have a problem, you're going to call Barry. Um, and then we've got the additional information as well. I'm not going to, again, bore you with all of that uh, information. So we'll put a bow on it and say that's the presentation that we've got. And obviously, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. We know we'll be back. So if there are questions after this, reach out to uh, Pam and or Chris to the extent that she's available and let us know. All right, thanks, Tom and Jonathan. Uh, board members, let's, I, I guess, uh, in the interest of time, why don't, if, if you want to ask or make a, any sort of comment, why don't each of us get one one opportunity? Doug, can I make one, uh, one last comment? Sure, Jonathan. If I might, I, I, neither Tom or I pointed it out, and I think most people have realized this, but just kind of for the record, as part of this, we are doing away with that piece of roadway that that's currently kind of lines the front of, of all these units or all these prop properties. Okay. All right. So does anybody want to say anything this evening? 
Yeah, let's put up our hands. I've got four so far. Karin, you got here first. Um, and, and try to yeah. keep it fairly <laughs> concise. Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, I, it's very exciting and it's going to be kind of a really initial, it's going to set the tone for university uh, drive and a lot of things that we want to happen. One thing I want to plea is that we start thinking about dedicated bicycle paths if in the setback, that we don't have bicycle paths that share the road, but really have, as you have all over bicycling countries, make a, a sidewalk that has, you know, part of it set off for bicycles. So you really get bicycle traffic going to the university coasting. That's, if that could somehow be initiated with this and carried through, that's, I think, is something that I would plead that you would try to consider. Okay, thanks, Karen. Tom, I'm, rather than have you respond to these things, I think, let's just use this as, here are some issues you need to think about as you prepare when you come back. Sounds great. Okay, Johanna. Great, thank you so much. And thanks for the presentation, Tom and Jonathan. Um, all in all, my reaction is that this is a big improvement to existing conditions. We are redeveloping this area without sacrificing hardly any open space and yet accomplishing a ton of policy goals that the town is looking to accomplish, including adding a lot of housing, including affordable units, and the opportunity to use this private investment to leverage state money to improve that intersection. Um, so I think there's a lot to love here. Um, I think it's really thoughtful in terms of, of the stormwater and the plantings. Um, and then my big question is, so much of this is paradigm shifting, but that doesn't extend to parking. Um, this is a location that's super close to the university. It's right on the bike path. I don't know the relationship to the bus stop. So that's one question I have. Um, and I just love to hear you articulate why we need so much of this space committed to parking. Um, and then I guess I have a second, just like, question or critique about the lighting. Um, there's a new development that went in close to where I live in Southeast Amherst Center. Um, and the lighting there I find to be overkill. Every time I pass by at night, I'm like, there is nobody out here and this entire parking lot is illuminated. And I don't know exactly where the town is with like its official dark sky desig I don't think we're like pursuing dark sky designation. I know we've adopted some dark sky standards, but I would like you to think about the lighting plan really thoughtfully so that it's not overkill without compromising public safety for ecological reasons. Thank you. All right, thanks, Johanna. Fred. Uh yeah, just uh, I, I I agree that this is a huge step forward in terms of uh, accomplishing the uh, public policy objectives of the town. Uh, that is absolutely the case. Uh, just a, a brief question at the Tom at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned the overlay and that you were looking at interfacing with that and looking possibly at a six story. And I'm wondering if uh, uh, you could give us just a, a, a thumbnail here of what that six story would look like, uh, and just a, a verbal th thumbnail description of, of how it would would uh, be realized in this case. I'm assuming you've had some conversations about that. Tom, do you want to comment briefly on that? <laughs> or do you want to wait until you come back? Briefly is probably the key word. Uh, sure. So I'll just, um, I've got an image I can show what that additional story would do. It would be five in the front, six in the back. So where you see four, it would just be adding a story. And then the back where you see five, it would go up to six. That would add 26 units and um, 90 beds. 
And if I can figure out how to, I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, we've got a image showing. Maybe that's not, let me see if I can get it. Um, I won't take any more of your time. I'll bring it back next time with the with that sixth story. Okay. All right. Thanks, Fred. Jesse. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I won't go back over the positives that the other planning board members just highlighted because I totally agree. I think there's a lot and I really appreciate how the design largely fits in with a lot of things we've been talking about already. Um, I definitely I was going to ask about the hopefully there'll be still a setback if you do go six floors. It sounds like there is. Um, I really appreciate what Johanna said about not minimally increasing the covered space. I think that's fantastic. I did want to reiterate what Karen brought up. You know, as I think you've seen in the overlay, we're hoping to really maintain this walkway, bikeway, wider uh, setback to allow for foot traffic and bike traffic, roller skating, whatever. Um, so I would hope you could build that in. And that also relates to the other main point I wanted to bring up, which is about that extra curb cut that you were that you brought up as well. I completely see the appeal of having a drive-through establishment there. I think it would be tremendously popular. Um, but I have a hard time, I'm no traffic expert, I have a hard time imagining such a minimal impact on the traffic from 170 parking spaces and potentially drive-through business. Uh, so I wonder if there's a way to engineer that onto Amity Street instead of University Drive, or if that second curb cut's really necessary. Because again, if the overlay happens, or even if it doesn't, the redevelopment of the whole strip, there's just going to be more and more curb cuts, right? And that will just prevent the walking, biking potential on that side. So that's all. Just comment. Um, again, overall, I think it's a great project. Looking forward to the next discussions. Thanks. OK, Jesse and Bruce. Um, I just want to agree that uh, I think this is a interesting, exciting, worthwhile, and a positive example of what we were imagining could be done here. Uh, so I think in my uh, mind as we move forward, I'll probably be interested in how this project uh, can be uh, a positive, uh, remain being and more and be more and more of, a, of a, a, an explicit example of what the, an overlay could be. I think it's an interesting situation where the uh, project by virtue of having a, a variance uh, is um, going to be built or is, is being built, certainly being designed and is in development before the actual overlay. So it's a, it's a, it's not exactly a cart leading a horse, but it is a little bit backwards. And I think we should uh, um, take advantage of that. And I'll be thinking of how we can do that, uh, uh, all parties, uh, but I'm uh, very positive. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Bruce. And uh, Tom, I'll just mention a, a few topics that came to mind. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, and thanks, Jonathan. It is a nice design. I'll reiterate, I'll endorse all of the positive comments you've gotten. Um, things I wondered about uh, electric car chargers. Where is the dumpster and how is the trash being handled? Because I didn't see anything for as far as a dumpster bay, I guess I'd call it. Uh, rooftop mechanical units. I didn't see any in the renderings and they often don't show up in the renderings. But I hope they will show up if they are, are proposed. And then um, it'd be great to have a little more maybe a, like a section about through the University Drive frontage that show the curb, show the public sidewalk, show the street trees, show your sidewalk, and show the, the building front. Because, you know, it, it, the overlay, we talked a lot about a 10-foot sidewalk and um, but we never, I don't remember us being really clear, at least I wasn't clear in my head about, is that on the public side of the property line or is it on the private side? And just how is that whole stretch gonna be uh, distributed? Um, Karin mentioned a bike path. Obviously there's a bike path on the other side. 
of the road. Um, and I know when UMass built University Drive farther north, there's a subst substantive bike path as part of the travel way on both sides of that section. So I just think it'd be good for you to illustrate what condition are you proposing and how does that relate to the existing public condition? So and just a section, so I'm clear. So just a section, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining northerly, like from yeah. the north looking yeah, southerly. Yeah, section northerly from, yeah, with the building at the left and the, the, the road at the right. Thank you. We, we can do that. The, the other thing, Doug, that wasn't in this, or isn't in the submission so far as we've been working on some 3D views kind of standing in that space, say standing on our sidewalk looking, the one I have on my screen is looking south. You know, it doesn't show yet that that public sidewalk, um, you know, and, and so it's, it's, I don't want to share it tonight, but I think that might also be helpful is to be able to kind of see it from the experiential level as well. Okay, great. Okay, um, so with that, uh, I guess I'll, I'll offer public comments. Uh, are there any members of the public who would like to comment? Uh, please raise your hand. All right, and I will mention that if this were going to be a more in-depth discussion, I would have asked for board members who participated in the site visits to report. But since we're not really getting that deep into it tonight, I haven't done that. Uh, but when, when you come back, I would like us to start with uh, board member site observations. Okay, so the time now is 7.32. Um, would any board member like to make a motion to continue? Um, and Chris or Pam, do you have suggestions for a date to which we might continue? Chris. Well, oh, Pam and I could, um, maybe chime in together. I think that it would be helpful to have some indication of what is going on with CONCOM. And so I would ask um, Mr. Reedy, when are you planning to submit and when do you think you might have some kind of reaction from CONCOM and maybe you would, um, the planning board would continue its public hearing till a time after the after. CONCOM has at least its first hearing. So I would expect that we're submitting, um, if not Friday, probably Monday, Tuesday. I mean, we've got, it's, we're just pulling together the application. We have everything. It's just literally, I signed it yesterday. So uh, I would expect to submit it next week. That probably puts us on, oh, maybe, I forget if CONCOM, let me see, when do they meet usually? Are they second and fourth? They're second and fourth Wednesdays of the month. Yeah, they're opposite us. Right. So maybe October 9th, maybe the 23rd. And I guess the only other uh, factor to consider um, is the zoning bylaw amendment. And so I'm going to back up and say, Ideally, this is in construction when the ground thaws next spring, so 2025. That that would be ideal. And so, so how uh, about November 6th for this um, continued public hearing? Because if the CONCOM meeting might be either the 9th or the 23rd, 23rd. of October, you'll have some sense of how the CONCOM is feeling about this by yeah. November 6th. I think that'd be perfect. Okay. Okay, and we're going to say at 7.05, right? Because do we expect to be having a later start time? Yeah, I think we, we ought to make that assumption. 
Okay. So we're going to say 705 on November 6. Okay. In that case, I'm going to call on Bruce. Um, just for everybody's information, I'll be in Australia at that time. Though I just checked my world clock and the meeting would uh, seven, so it would be uh, it'll be nine in the morning, so I could join. Um, no. uh, so uh, with that, I will uh, move continuation of the public hearing uh, to uh, November sixth at seven o five p.m. All right, thank you, Jesse. A second that. Okay. Board members, any other comments about this topic or about the motion to continue the hearing? All right, I am not seeing anything. And we'll go start at the end of the last name of the alphabet. Karen. I approve. Johanna. Aye. Uh, Lawrence. Aye. Jesse. Aye. Fred. Aye. Bruce. Aye. And I'm an I as well. It's unanimous. We are continued to November 6th at 7.05 p.m. Tom and Barry and Jonathan, we'll see you in November. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, the time now is 7.36. Um, and we are about to start the next item on the agenda, which is a public hearing for a project at Amherst College. And I am gonna give Larry Lawrence Klutz the opportunity to make a brief statement before we get into it. Thank you, Doug. I uh, uh, spoke to the uh, attorney of the day today at the Ethics Commission, and um, given that I'm an Amherst College employee, it was their recommendation that um, I recuse myself from the discussion and vote on this issue. So uh, I'm going to drop off for a little while, and we'll rejoin you all on the other end. All right. Thank you, Larry. Lawrence. I'll, I'll, I'll get that down soon enough. Okay. So... Um, in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2025-04, Amherst College at 38 Woodside Avenue requesting a site plan review approval for accessibility improvements to the Amherst College Cadigan House under section 3.330.0 of the zoning bylaw, including a waiver request related to parking for additional waivers that may be needed. Parcel is on map 14A-191 in the RG zoning district. All right, so do we have any board member disclosure other than La Lawrence's uh, recusal? Bruce. Um, I think I understand that uh, my former firm is involved not in the uh, site design of this, but in the building associated with it uh, and the renovations within which have driven the need to do this work. And since I noticed Jesse's in the audience, I, I probably should say that although that uh, uh, firm has my name on the door. That's the only res best, uh, residue of any association. I have no business interest, and uh, I feel uh, quite able to uh, participate in this hearing without uh, any conflict. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Any other disclosures? Okay. All right, so uh, let's see, Pam, we have brought over Chris Chamberlain. Anybody? I brought over Chris, but Chris, guide me if there's others. Sure, um, Jesse Selman, Seth Wilshertz, and Rachel Belanger. 
Okay, I tried to bring Seth over before, they, but he... They, he they may stay back, but okay. definitely Jesse. <laughs> They're here in spirit, at least. Okay, okay. I, I recognized him. Okay. I'm going to, I'll give it one more try, see if he wants to come over. All righty. All right. Well, welcome, Chris, Jesse, and Rachel, and Seth. Um, Chris, I should I assume you will be moderating for your team? Uh, yes. And unless any surprising questions come up, I may be the only one you hear from, but it's always good to have the team here. Okay. Well, welcome, and you can go on into your presentation. Great. Um, so I am Chris Chamberlain, uh, Berkshire Design Group, a uh, civil engineer on this project. Um, Jesse Selman from CNH Architects is working on the architecture inside the building. And Seth and Rachel, who just joined on, are uh, project managers for Amherst College. Um, so to just orient us all, um, this is the main campus of Amherst College, close to downtown, as you all know. Um, we are looking at this property here, 38 Woodside Avenue. Um, this entire block is full of properties that are owned by Amherst College, but are not part of the educational district that's associated with campus. It's part of a residential zoning district. And so while the use of the building that we're going to be talking about now is an educational use that is by right, um, the site improvements are occurring in a residential zone um, and so thus uh, triggering site plan review um, and, in a, and requesting an official um, approval from the planning board. Um, this uh, building is here. If you've been down Woodside Avenue, you may recognize it in all its 1960s architectural glory. Um, this was previously the Center for Religious and Spiritual Life, which is actually still listed here on Google, um, although uh, the college has uh, removed that use to elsewhere in campus and replaced it with uh, certain student service um, uh, portions of the college administration, um, and that uh, use is already active um, in it. Uh, in order to support that use in this building, uh, there have been a number of interior modifications uh, that are proposed and moving forward. Um, and enough of that has happened that it's triggered uh, a need to do full accessibility on the building uh, in order to comply with modern codes. In the existing condition, um, accessibility is inadequate, really. There is sort of a side entrance over here off of a driveway that brings you into an uh, outdated lift uh, that spills onto the main story of the building. Uh, it is not compliant uh, in full with current accessibility codes. And even if it were given that this is gonna be the student services building, it's really inadequate for what this use is gonna be. Um, and so uh, the proposed project, which I'll bring up in just a moment, uh, is to improve accessibility to this building. Um, and so just before I uh, bring up the plans, I just want to orient a couple of things. So in the existing site, we've got sort of this semicircular driveway, um, as well as um, a main staircase. As you can see, the the main floor of this building is elevated quite a ways from the street. In addition, we've got a more than 4% grade on the street from left to right in this photo. Um, so there are, as you can imagine, some challenges with creating accessible um, entry into this building. Um, and so now flipping to the um, uh, site plan that was submitted, uh, this is the existing site that we were just looking at. Um, and uh, scrolling down, the proposed site plan is here. Uh, and really what we're proposing to do is relatively limited, um, but what we um, do want to do is uh, first and foremost, create an accessible route and entry from a public way, which complies with code into the um, main floor of this building. Uh, and uh, the goal is to achieve that um, at the front main entry, which, as you saw in that first photo, is certainly not uh, possible under existing conditions. And so what uh, this project would do is reconstruct the stairway to create a larger landing at first floor elevation. 
and then provide a less than 5% sidewalk um, along this route here to get to the public sidewalk, which then checks off our accessibility requirement per code. Now, since we're not proposing to create formal parking spaces here, there's not a requirement for ADA parking. But once again, since this is the student services um, uh, department, uh, theoretically, every student on campus at some point in time is going to need to visit this building. It would also be inappropriate to not provide that parking. Um, and so another goal of this project is to create a full legal ADA accessible parking space um, and then connect that via the public sidewalk um, to that accessible route that I just described. Now we went through eight or 10 different iterations of what we could do with the front of this building to try to do improvements beyond simply just creating a, a single um, ADA space. Um, all of them had their challenges. Um, we actually did originally submit a different layout to this project, which DPW disfavored uh, because of potential conflicts between parking spaces and the sidewalk, which sent us once again back to the drawing board to try to come up with additional um, options. And at the end of the day, all we could come up with were options that created a, quite a lot of site work for very minimal benefit. Um, and so the college then um, uh, sort of advanced this as the preferred option where we'll simply um, repave uh, and slightly reconstruct this existing um, access to the front of the building, um, regrade enough so that we can have a, a very clear and you know, legally sloping ADA access and some additional sidewalk um, in order to make that connection. There's an existing bike rack that we'll replace with new bike parking to match the bike racks that were put up at the uh, Lyceum building, which is a little bit behind here, um, and otherwise retain the site pretty much as is, uh, with the exception of a little bit of exterior lighting to light this path that I'll show in just a moment. And so just to run down what all of those changes are real quick, which I, I mentioned a number of them, um, striping and uh, code signage for this accessible parking space, uh, new accessible sidewalk, less than 5%, rebuilt stairs uh, with a larger landing. Um, in order to make this slope work here, uh, we are proposing a small uh, 12 to 18 inch segmental block retaining wall, really pretty minimal, um, but just enough so that we're not causing that slope to spill into the driveway. Um, repaving of uh, this semicircular driveway, um, repaving and to a very minor extent reconstruction of the public sidewalk. Um, we are also adding, uh, proposing to add this non-accessible walkway, which is really just a convenience path, uh, knowing that a number of students are going to come from Central Campus through the Lyceum site down this driveway. Inevitably, this would become a goat path, um, and some sometime in the future, facilities would likely come along and want to pave it anyway. Um, so we're going to formalize that path now with a hard surface. Um, the site has an accessible route into the building, so this is simply an additional route, no different than this set of stairs right here, uh, just as convenience for people who want to choose to use that um, to access the building. Um, and then um, I'd also note that in the existing condition, this semicircular driveway, as folks at the site visit this morning noticed, is used quite informally um, as parking for staff and visitors in this building. Uh, we anticipate that the southern portion of this driveway uh, may continue to be used informally that way. Uh, when the driveway is empty, this accessible space is uh, reachable from two directions uh, in the event that, that that's continued to use. Uh, this parking space is still accessible from the northern portion of this driveway uh, with no problem there. And the remaining space really is not viable for parking. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, the college is going to um, uh, ensure that enforcement of blocking these sidewalks and things like that is taken care of so that this side is open. Um, and I'll just note that, you know, some members of the board are probably already familiar with how the college handles parking, but um, 
I'll note that the informal parking in this driveway is not part of the college's inventory of parking spaces. They have certain uh, agreements and understandings with the town as to how much parking they're gonna have. So the official count of parking spaces on campus doesn't change with this project. Um, and uh, it's important to understand that there is no one in the college community from the president all the way down to a freshman who has any reserved parking space on campus. All spaces are available to all uh, college parking pass holders. Um, and uh, there are uh, a number of employees and visitors to this building. When there are parking spaces available nearby, they get the, uh, uh, they're lucky enough to use them. And if not, they need to park uh, in other parking lots and spaces around campus and walk to the building, which is pretty common um, across campus. Uh, most people are walking some distance from wherever they may be parking upon arrival um, to the buildings that they're going to. So this is really no different than the way that the, the rest of campus um, operates um, under, uh, under that uh, regime. Um, and then the other drawing I'll highlight, we can come back to those others if there are uh, questions, but there, uh, we did submit a lighting plan uh, that the architecture group put together with a couple of new lighting fixtures um, that are shielded and downward pointing uh, to create a little more illumination on the landing and new walkway here. There's an existing light, uh, uh, street light on the pole here that um, pretty well illuminates the street area. Um, and uh, never mind the uh, layout here, this was a previous one of those failed iterations of potential parking on this site. Um, but this lighting plan is really focused on new lighting for the walkway. Uh, lighting for the existing turnaround seems adequate. And so there's really nothing out on the street side um, that's proposed. Um, and then we just did include, uh, this may help illustrate for uh, from another angle, um, the existing staircase here is to be replaced with a larger landing um, and then uh, a staircase coming down. And I guess uh, just one last thing, because this did come up in staff comments, they um, asked about the railing work. Um, and so we provided a quick detail um, of the handrail, oh, sorry. <laughs> That is the wrong one. Um, we provided a detail of the handrail, which I will bring up in just a moment, um, which is uh, sort of a simplified uh, stripped down version of the same Julius Bloom handrail that's a campus standard um, throughout all of the exterior um, staircases that are going there. So this is uh, really, uh, uh, just a, a stair like many of the other site stairs around campus, uh, visually and functionally. Um, and so that is perhaps even more detail than, than we need to review this project, but uh, happy to take any questions um, or comments you know, on any of that. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, so I think we had a site visit this maybe to this afternoon. Um, are there any members of the board who would like to uh, recap what you observed on your site visit? Did we have a site? Okay. Yes, right. Karen. Yeah, I think it's very straightforward. I think that they've done a very good job at making it accessible. I mean, it's not, the whole thing isn't, beautiful or anything like that is very practical um and they've gone through every option and and i i think it's we should approve it okay um questions from the board bruce um also, just because I was at the site visit as well, but I was late, so I didn't get the full benefit. But uh, I think that that uh, uh, Google Street View that uh, Chris provided pretty much gives everybody the uh, same amount of information that we got at the site visit. So no one needs to feel uh, disadvantaged because they weren't there. It was a that image just showed everything, and that was pretty much the sum total of, of the visit. Um, the the uh, the 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 project certainly involves, as Chris, you have said, the uh, work on the public way on the sidewalk. Um, is it the 
in, I mean, presumably there's, there's a question now of, of, of whether the town does this work or whether the college does, whether the college contractor does this work. Is that, uh, is, is, is that work on the public way something that would be done separately by the town? It seemed like it would be kind of a bit of a nightmare to try and coordinate if it is. is what, what's, the, what's the plan for that? What, what, what are your constraints and approvals associated with whatever you do? Yeah, um, and so really we're just um, repaving that uh, existing sidewalk uh, in the same location. Um, certainly the, the college is happy to do that. I think uh, similar to any other sort of development site, um, when you have a, a construction site and uh, damage the sidewalk, you come through at the end and replace it, even though it is uh, part of the public sidewalk. You, so you would get, uh, you would have some approval from the town, uh, from the DPW, I imagine, associated with doing that. Yes, and the original plan that I mentioned did go to DPW. Um, they were not happy with the layout, um, but they didn't identify any concerns with reconstructing the sidewalk. Um, we, I don't think, unless Chris received any at the last minute, I don't think we officially heard back from DPW on this latest plan, um, but we'd certainly be happy to have a, a condition that, you know, any work in the right of way um, be uh, approved by them. All right, um, Bruce, I assume that's the end of your questions. Yes. Sorry, okay. I thought I'd, I just unmuted myself, but I didn't take my hand. Chris. Hi, I just wanted to mention that at the last minute, I sent Pam and Nate some potential conditions and a finding. So mm -hmm. when you get to that point, you might want to refer to those. Okay. I didn't receive those. So Nate, I hope you have them. Perfect. Okay. Um, Chris, I guess I was had a couple of questions. One was about, um, it seems like a lot of effort on the front of the building for one, one ADA space, which probably could be just as easily accommodated, if not easy, more easily at the south end of the building down on the lower level. So I was just wondering, is the part of the interior uh, work, does that include a new elevator or replacing the antiquated lift? So the, uh, and Jesse may be able to give a little bit more background on this, but I'll, I'll explain what I know. So essentially right now, the accessible entrance such as it is comes into a janitor's closet in the basement, and then a lift comes up into a different closet and spills out onto the first floor. It's really bad. Yeah. Um, and so uh, theoretically, I suppose there may be an entire elevator uh, that could be here. But uh, CNH worked with the building inspector, and essentially the basement level is just going to be closed off to employees only. Um, and the public facing, if you will, for the college community space is the first floor. Um, and I believe access to the, uh, to the basement level is going to be restricted. Um, theoretically, the parking would work down here. But it's just, it's not an appropriate entrance for... Uh, really, what would be any member of the college community that's going to uh, that's going to regularly be accessing this building? So uh, that was explored, but it was really seen as a non-starter and requiring even more work than the site work that you're seeing. Okay, so the existing antiquated lift is either staying or just being removed, but it's not being improved. It would stay, but it's not being improved. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Um, and then the second question I have concerns this convenience walk. Um, my experience at another institution of higher education in town is that um, we're not allowed to do those. That if it that if we don't meet the ADA requirements for a walkway, we don't build it. 
And so I'm just puzzled why you think you can do this. But to most build, of the sidewalks that exist. Side, I'm sorry. But most of the sidewalks that exist throughout town are not ADA. Well, I, I know I know existing sidewalks are obviously grandfathered and sidewalks that are steeper than 5% are allowed next to as a as an adjunct to a roadway but on a you know an unimproved site i guess i'm not familiar with that so you well the college has a, a tremendous we have a, a, a i will say we have an accessible network of pathways of pedestrian pathways but by by no means are all of the pathways on campus accessible that would be literally impossible so so our so our our is a size a walkway like this going to be signed as non-compliant so that nobody in a in a wheelchair starts down it and discovers they've got a problem we sign it the opposite way right we sign the accessible path we don't sign non-accessible paths we tell people where to go for the accessible path hmm. And, the, and we're putting up signage all over campus over the next, some of them exist now, uh, uh, and they're mostly, um, a lot of those signs went through planning board and town council approval, and they're coming on a campus over the next few months to direct people where accessible pathways into buildings are. Again, we, ex we do the opposite of that. We don't tell people this is not accessible. We say the accessible path is this way. Uh -huh. Okay, well, your experience is quite different than mine. And uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that Nate Malloy has had extensive conversations with the building commissioner about this topic, and maybe he has something to offer. Okay, Nate? Sure, <clears throat> he wouldn't allow it um, because it's new work performed and it has to meet ADA and so the proposed condition is that all walkways, site walkways meet ADA and AAB. And he, he would not, you know, approve this walkway right now. And so whether or not it's, you know, part of the accessible route, it's new work performed. It's not a public sidewalk adjacent to the road that has that exception. It's a new walkway. And so, you know, he, he just won't allow it. And so he doesn't think the, he thinks the planning board should approve it with that condition that it meets ADA and AAB and, you know, and then either uh, they can discuss it after the fact or figure out how to build it. Um, but as shown, it is not, um, it wouldn't be compliant. And so that's my understanding as well. It's not, you know, if there's an existing pathway and it's out of tolerance and you're going to rebuild it, it needs to become compliant. And if it's a ramp, it needs landings and handrails and, you know, the proper slope, not, you know, a 12% is incredibly steep. Yeah, it does seem like, uh, you know, at that, at that slope, you probably could, could make it a ramp with the, 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 hand, the handrails and landings. Um, so Nate, it sounds like one condition that we might, might want to impose is that all sidewalks uh, that are part of this project meet ADA and MAAB. Right. I mean, that's kind of implied, but maybe explicitly uh, would be important for that one walkway. Yeah, I would request that that be um, um, per re that it defer to review by the building commissioner as opposed to stating that requirement directly. I think that our team would want to uh, have those same conversations and make sure we understand. Uh, my understanding has always been that an accessible route to a building is required by AAB, but not that all possible routes um, be made accessible. But that's not uh, obviously uh, the, those conversations have been had offline, and I don't think we need to have that in this forum. Um, but if, as long as we have some flexibility uh, to defer to the building commissioner at least, as opposed to just stating that that's gonna be the requirement of this plan. I think that we'd be fine with that condition. Well, the building commissioner cautioned the planning board approving something that's out of compliance and out of tolerance. 
Yeah, I mean, it I seems think we like have a difference of opinion on his interpretation, and we have those often. And I think we're, we are requesting that we have that conversation directly with him. Right, and and if you have the conversation, he's sounds like he would have to be convinced that what you're doing is compliant with AAB, yes, and ADA we're, we're and more with that. We do that MAAB. So yeah. if we put that condition on, it would still. Uh, still leave you the flexibility to have your conversation with the inspector. Yeah, and to be clear, those are conversations we have all the time and we and we have many, many situations where their initial interpretation is reverse. So be it. Bruce. Um, I, I, I kind of ag uh, agree that we shouldn't uh, uh, impose this condition. Um, I don't know if this is a strong uh, proposal, but it seems to me that it's not our obligation to enforce the uh, state uh, uh, building codes and uh, architectural access board codes. That's, uh, that's the building commissioner's uh, domain. And I don't think by approving this, particularly with the minutes that uh, will be associated with this uh, hearing, that we need to condition it. I think uh, it would be better that we didn't. That, as uh, both parties have said, gives them a uh, a room to negotiate or discuss or whatever. And then, depending on the outcome, uh, if we don't have a condition in there, they wouldn't have to come back. Uh, and modify whatever that condition might be, depending on the outcome. Uh, I don't think it reflects badly on us, uh, as I say, but because the discussion is minuted, I think it would be appropriate for us not to. Um, but um, I'm troubled that the building commissioner would think that it was necessary for the planning board to uh, uh, get involved in uh, state regulations. Okay. Board members, other comments? No other comments. Oh, Karen. I agree with Bruce. I think that we should give uh, Amherst College the flexibility to have this conversation with the building commissioner um, as they have had experience with it. Okay, Nate. Sure. I guess one other comment is that during the discussion, it was mentioned that other cars may end up parking in the driveway. And so, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a question that staff had asked because, you know, it could very well be that this space becomes, you know, inaccessible. It can't be reached. And so, you know, if, if cars end up parking here, I mean, you're saying, Oh, well then someone could also park come in here because there's no re way a car could park here, but you know, cars often park like this. And so, you know, unless there's clear signage indicating that it remains open, I just, I would be concerned that, you know, cars will continue to, you know, use this eyebrow as we call it to park, at, you know, however, you know, the cars park. And so, Chris, you know, how, Chris, is, how do is, you... is there signage or anything that will indicate that this needs to be available as, you know, a drive up aisle and yeah so uh, in this area in order to park here i think as was just drawn you'd have to block the sidewalk which would be parked illegally and the uh, college police would would uh enforce that regardless um i don't think we would have an objection and seth can correct me if i'm wrong we wouldn't have an objection to adding signage or potentially hatching striping in front of this area so that we can ensure that at all times there's at least one access to this parking space Okay. Um, let's try to remember to require that. All right. Um, Nate, you, you sounded like you had draft findings and conditions. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so given that it seems like, well, I haven't seen them, so I don't know how long they are. Um, I'm thinking maybe we should take a five minute break now. We usually do that at around eight o'clock. Yeah, I mean, right now there's five conditions and the findings are uh, as simple as that 
the board finds this meets the criteria of 11.24. Oh, okay. right. so, well, I mean, we can we'll take continue. a break, but they're not extensive findings or conditions. Okay. All right. So maybe Nate, if you could bring them up. Is that visible for everyone? Yes. Yes. And I was just um, working on five. So uh, the first possible uh, condition, the project shall be built substantially in accordance with the plans submitted to the planning board and approved on today's date. Uh, the project shall be managed uh, substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted with the application and approved by the board on uh, the condition three is the secondary three foot wide pathway between the front entrance and the driveway on the north side shall meet ADA and AAB requirements. So there was a discussion about removing this or modifying it to say that it would be discussed with the building commissioner. I don't know where the board would want to go with that. All right. Well, we've heard from Bruce and Karen that they would support removing that. Um, Jesse, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think it should be in there. I think it should be building commissioner. Discussion. Okay. Uh, Johanna, any comments from you on that? Um. It sounds like at UMass, they it's a requirement. In any other parking or any other sidewalk of this type in the town, would it also be required? I'm, I feel like I need more information to know exactly which recommend, whether just deferring to the building commissioner on this is the kind of yeah, I... cleanest way to move forward. I, th I think it probably is the cleanest way to move forward to defer to the to the commissioner. Um, you know, we would need to modify number one so that it's, you know, substantially as drawn with or without the secondary walkway as determined by the building commissioner. Um, so, but I, I don't think it's necessary to uh, reference other other experiences in town. I mean, do we, I mean, to me, if, let's play this out, say the building commissioner says, oh, it needs out of tolerance, it can't be built. If they remove it, to me, it's a de minimis change to the plans. But if we want to okay. have that first, the first condition allow that or some changes, we could, we could make that, Doug, that language change as you suggested. Okay. Um, so but I sure. guess it sounds Most like way. we should remove that. Yep. yep. And then four, all exterior lights shall be downcast and not shine onto adjacent properties. Bruce? Right. I think Nate was going to say something, but uh, uh, I, I was going to suggest that we uh, add that the uh, uh, work in the public way uh, receive approval from the DPW. And I, I like the idea of uh, signage or striping to indicate that uh, no parking on the northern uh, uh, outfall of the semicircular uh, driveway. Yeah, so uh, condition four, now three would be, you know, as Doug mentioned, the exterior lights. The next one would be there shall be signage indicating that the handicapped space and aisle remain available, and we can modify that. Uh, could it be signage or, or signage or striping? Because uh, Chris mentioned the option of uh, striping as a way of doing that. And then work within the public way shall be approved by public works before installation. We say construction, but... Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I see the work in the public way as um, 
you know, it's more than maintenance, but it's really just replacing what's there. And so when Public Works commented on the other, other iterations, I think the engineer also just said, well, you know, if you repaved it or if it was considered almost like maintenance, we'd be okay with it. And so, I mean, that helped with, you know, the decision probably to keep what's there, just given all the, you know, complexities of slope and um, access requirements, but we can still have them check. You have an interesting typo in number six there, Nate. Mm. Okay. Uh, Fred. Yeah, two things. Uh, one is uh, item five. Uh, after the word aisle, I would add the words R2, A R E. Two, yes, are to remain available. And my major concern is with striking out item three because the way I read item three, and maybe I'm wrong. I thought item three described that uh, long meandering ADA compliant path that first went north, then a little bit east, and then south into the main entrance. I thought that's what three was, and th three is uh, AAB con uh, compliant. Am I am I missing that? Yeah, if I sketch this quickly, here's the road. They're gonna put a walkway here to the front of the building, which is here. This section is five feet, this is four feet, and then the three foot path was this, you know, dog leg up to the driveway of the Lyceum. So. I think it's like the, the three foot uh, identifier is calling out just kind of this one section of path. Well, I. Which is I'm not part not, of the accessible I'm, I'm route. I'm still not confident that what's, what's struck out here is what we want struck out. I'm. Well, if we take it out, we won't have anything to be misleading people. I mean, I if I were writing this, I'd leave three exactly the way it came in, and I'd add another one that uh, the that describes that rearward path and and sends that to the building commissioner. So you be in favor of that of of, of explicit. Yeah, I, I'd leave it in, and then I would with well, a, another do. item. I would address the 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 path that runs, uh, I guess, northeast. Uh, that uh, I I think I heard was a ten or twelve percent grade. Uh, that's a, a non-starter in terms of AAB, but it, I don't think it's what's described in three. Well, we don't really need uh, a description of the ADA compliant path in the conditions because it's basically the whole point of the project. And the drawings show that it is compliant. Typically, we don't we don't typically we don't have a condition like this at all because staff reviews it to make sure that it's compliant, right? We would just we'll make sure the slopes are are good. And so, you know, in, in a typical site plan, once it gets to the building permit application, the inspectors also look at it. And if it's if it's something that needs to be changed, they can change and it can be de minimis or it will come back to the planning board. And so it's implied that typically all work shown on a site plan is gonna to have to be reviewed by the inspectors and be compliant. And so, you know, this was suggested just because of that one steep part. And you know, I think it could be removed, knowing that it will still be reviewed by the building commissioner and building inspectors. And if it needs to then change the site plan significantly, it could come back. Or as Doug mentioned, we could change condition one so that it says, you know, substantially in accordance with the plans, or you know, and as discussed or approved by the building commissioner. Uh, and then that, to me, that would allow that conversation to happen. Yeah, I think, uh, Fred, I think you and actually I are in the minority on this, um, that 
we don't really need to call this out. And I, I don't think we need to call out explicitly that the compliant actual ADA route to the front door that's being proposed to be constructed needs to meet ADA and AAB because it clearly shows on the drawings that, that it does. All right, Fred, I will take your silence as yeah. perhaps okay. the, okay, all right. Uh, there were a number of other hands up. I, do any of you want to go ahead and speak? Karen? So as I understand it, the, um this path that's steep is just being built or, or it's being paved because that is the way that the traffic is going to go. And otherwise it's just going to be a, a, a dog path, you know, mm -hmm. and look terrible. So, so that, that is a question. Do you just let it be a dog path and, and then you have no responsibility because you haven't paved it or do you pave it? But I think the building commissioner and Amherst college should have that conversation. Yeah, I think that's that's the way we're headed. Um, Seth? I was going to just echo Karen's comment that I we will of course have the conversation with the building commissioner. We would never propose to do something that's not compliant. That said, if people are going to walk the path anyway, which they will, then having paving there for people who are able to use it is generally going to be safer than not. And so that was the whole purpose of the pathway. I think if we go down this path and we do not convince Rob Mora otherwise, we would just delete that portion of the path. Yep, I, I think I agree with you. Jesse? I would also suggest that you not <clears throat> start the precedent of needing to list all the laws that need to be followed for your projects. I think that that would be a difficult path, path pun intended, for your group to follow. Thank you. All right, so at the moment, I don't see any additional hands. Nate, at the moment, we've got five conditions. Condition number three is struck. Um, I assume the uh, date of approval would be today. Uh, the finding, we have the one finding that the board finds that the project complies with the relevant criteria of section 11.24 of the bylaw. So we probably need a motion to adopt the findings as drafted here, or the conditions uh, to adopt the finding as drafted and to close the public hearing. We could take uh, ask if there's comment, public comment. Public yeah. comments, yeah. Well, we only have three members of the public. So we have, th do any of you want to make a comment about this project? I am not seeing any hands from the public. And Bruce, looks like you're the next hand. Yes, I would move uh, that the board grants approval of uh, uh, SPR 2025-04, the Amherst College, so it Woodside Avenue, um, uh, a project uh, with the uh, uh, findings as uh, presented, drafted, and with the five conditions as presented, drafted, and to close the public hearing. Okay, Johanna. Second the motion. Okay. Um, I probably should have done this before Bruce's uh, motion, but I guess I just wanted to ask, we did talk about altering condition number one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anybody want to, to, to do that or should we leave it just the way it is? Uh, I rather liked uh, your, as the mover, I rather liked your suggestion, Doug. It seemed like it uh, headed off uh, 
a small rabbit. Okay. Um, so I think the simplest phrasing I heard actually was from Nate, something to the effect uh, that we added um, as approved on today's date or uh, or as amended by the, the building commissioner uh, in subsequent uh, review. Review, thank you. Does that seem appropriate, Nate? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I think it also uh, it also dignifies the conversation we've been having. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's somehow obliquely represented in the right fine in the conditions. So yes, uh, I okay. So we friendly we, amendment accepted. Thank you. And um, I forget who our second seconded person was, Johanna. It was mm -hmm. me. He's yeah. I am fine keeping my second as amended. Okay, fine. All right. Uh, any further comments from the board? All right. So we have that motion and we will go through a roll call. Starting with you, Bruce. I approve. Thank you. Fred. I approve. All right. Jesse. Uh, I. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lawrence is recused. Johanna? Aye. Karen? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Six in favor, one recusal. Uh, Chris and team, thank you for coming. Uh, I'll be interested to know what the resolution is since I, I live with this uh, ambiguity in ADA daily. And good luck. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. All right. Time is 826. Why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break? Try to get back shortly after 830.
Okay, please turn on your video as you return so we know you're back. And Pam, maybe we should bring over the Wayfinders folks. Okay. Uh, Chris, should we wait for Nate to come back? Can't hear you. Nate might want to give a um, an intro. Okay. He did, he did when uh, this appeared before the Zoning Board of Appeals. So it was quite a good intro. Okay. So we'll give him a couple of minutes. Jamie, is Bruce part of your presentation team? Uh, yes. Okay, I'll bring him over as well. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Remarkably uh, few public uh, participants uh, yeah. this evening for a, cool. quite a few uh, um, things. Uh, everybody's on watching a full moon or something. I, uh... I don't know. I just sent Nate a text to see if he wants to give an intro. So maybe we wait one more minute. Mm. <laughs> I texted him too. <laughs> <laughs> His phone's going to go bing, bing. I think the full moon was last night with a partial eclipse. It was very cool. Yeah, it was yeah. too cloudy for us. Mm -hmm. But anyway, some people get days mm -hmm. wrong, you know, so, like me. The actual capacity of the full moon is supposed to be visible through tomorrow, I believe. It, it's very cloudy up here on the hill tonight, but last night it was stunning. I mean, you could have read a book outside. It was so bright. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, I don't know if Nate is coming back or not. Okay. So go ahead. All right. So uh, I guess I'll I'll read what you guys have read, given me to read for this introduction. Time is eight thirty-five. We're resuming our meeting. Uh, this is a pre presentation from. And uh, it's a presentation on a project that's before the Zoning Board of, Appro of Approval of Appeals. Um, this project came to us several months ago and the then board made a whole lot of comments on this project. And the applicant is back to show us where uh, the design has gone. And um, I see with this, intro, I've delayed long enough for Nate to return. Uh, we'd given up on you, Nate. Um, I was having so, a quick dinner. 
<laughs> okay, so I will read the following presentation regarding a request for a comprehensive permit under Mass General Law Chapter 40B to construct a 31 unit mixed income rental housing development in a three story development with on site parking proposed at 31 Southeast Street, map 15A, parcel 20, in the RVC zone and a 47 unit mixed income rental housing in a three-story building with on-site parking at 70 Belchertown Road. Uh, that's map parcels 15C, 58, 59, and 60 in the RN and FPC districts. So Nate, uh, Chris thought maybe you wanted to do an intro of your own. Uh, if that's so, go ahead and otherwise we'll welcome James and Bruce. Yeah, sure. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Nate Malloy, in case there's any attendees or anyone listening. The uh, so you know this was this is a comprehensive permit, a 40B application. The hearing was already opened uh, by the ZBA. It's been continued uh, till tomorrow night, and it will be continued probably for a number of, of hearings. And so this is coming to the planning board as part of the transmittal process. And you know after this discussion, you can make recommendations or provide comments to the ZBA as part of their review. So. It's also to show you what was what, changed from a previous meeting, but now it's actually officially an application. So, you know, this is a time when you can provide comments or recommendations to the zoning board. <clears throat> In terms of the project, you know, the town's been working on this for a number of years. Um, gosh, it, it could be about seven or eight years to get affordable housing in, uh, in East Amherst. So there, there's the school site and then the town purchased the properties. There's three properties on Belcher Town Road uh, for the specific purpose of affordable housing. Uh, then working with the housing trust, we developed a request for proposals. Wayfinders responded with a few other developers and they were chosen by the town because of their response. And so we had criteria for a number of things in terms of affordability, uh, programmatic elements on the site, uh, you know, marketing, uh, you know, kind of more than just a normal marketing, you know, broader marketing to be more inclusive. And so Wayfinders was chosen and we've been working with them for a few years now to get to this point. And so we're pretty excited about it. And so each site is really is really has a lot happening, right? In terms of what the town wanted, in terms of saving the E Street School, number of units, uh, open space, everything, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of room for, um, say, some other maybe amenity spaces or certain things that maybe other projects have uh, because of what we wanted in terms of at least 45 affordable units to make the, the financial piece work you know, Wayfinders came up with a really nice proposal. Uh, and so, you know, as a comprehensive permit, it means all local regulations, both zoning and general bylaw regulations can be waived to have the plans built because, uh, you know, the idea is that the need for affordable housing outweighs some of those regulations. Uh, and then they're also going through a notice of uh, intent approval with the Conservation Commission because there's state regulations in place in terms of uh, the Belchertown Road site and also um, you know, there's some wetlands on East Street School, but, you know, we're really happy with where it is right now in terms of the design, site design and architecture, you know, all the plans they've done. Uh, they worked with the neighbors, they've met with neighbors. Uh, there hasn't been anything but positive feedback. It's actually been pretty quiet at the zoning board. Uh, there's, you know, there's one minor comment about a design element from an abutting neighbor that, you know, can be worked out. It was pretty minor in my opinion. And so we're pretty happy to have this move forward long you know kind of a broader picture is that it's taken a long time to get here and if this is approved it still has to apply for permitting uh i mean financing and then go through per, you know building permit and it will still be another few years before it would be available as um you know a fully constructed building for occupancy and so you know the timeline for something like this can be eight to ten years and so um you know, it's just, you know, we're in the middle of it, but it is, you know, a longer planning horizon than some other private projects. So I guess with that, I'm, I can conclude unless there's specific questions about the 40B process. Okay, thank you, Nate. Welcome James and Bruce and show us where you're at. Gonna try to share the screen here. Let's see. I saw your screen briefly, then it went away. All right. How about that? Can you all see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. Great. Perfect. All 
right. Well, thank you all. Um, good evening. My name is Jamie Gruber. I'm a project manager at, um, at Wayfinders, the real estate development department. I'd like to start out by thanking the town staff and the members of the board for scheduling this time for us to present the project and uh, the changes that uh, we've made in response to our last presentation um, to the planning board in the spring. Um, as Nate said, we've had our first uh, hearing with the Zoning Board of Appeals for our comprehensive permit application that we submitted in, um, in July, and as well as our uh, first hearing uh, with the Conservation Commission. Um, both of those were in uh, late August. And I'm gonna just give you a brief overview of the, uh, of the, the, the project in general, just to kind of refresh everyone's um, you know, memory of, of, of what it is and so uh, Wayfinders is the largest nonprofit housing provider serving Western Mass for over 50 years. And uh, our organization provides services in the housing arena from homelessness through home ownership. Um, Wayfinders is a developer, a property manager, as well as a provider of housing related services to the broader community. Um, we, because we develop the properties um, with a commitment to owning and managing them long term, we're invested in working with the communities that surround each site. In terms of serving those who don't live in our properties, our housing centers in Springfield, Holyoke, and Northampton provide access to a, a wide variety of programs, including emergency rental assistance, first time home buyer education, or uh, and employment services. Um, Wayfinders has completed over 60 rental development projects, creating over 1,300 units and currently owns and manages over 800 rental units in Western Massachusetts across multiple sites, primarily up and down the I-91 corridor. Um, here are a few of our developments. They include Butternut Farms in Olympia Oaks and Amherst. Northampton, we have Live 155 in the Lumberyard on Pleasant Street, as well as um, Sergeant House on Bridge Street and Library Commons is one of our Holyoke developments. Um, we're, we're, Wayfinders will serve as a developer and project sponsor and will manage the project once completed. Um, our development team is, um, is we have Shat Schwartz and Fenton with Ellen Fryman, um, who's uh, experience in both affordable housing and 40B permits, the narrow gate architecture of mission driven firm focused on affordable and supportive housing, as well as niche engineers, CBA landscape architects, O'Reilly Talbot at Oak and NEI General Contracting as our pre-construction manager and Airtight Energy Consulting to provide sustainability and passive house consulting services. Um, as Nate mentioned, the um, this has been uh, years in the making and it has a significant investment in the town of Amherst and the Amherst uh, Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, in including providing the town land, town funds, and a lot of town staff time, all working collaboratively towards the goal to create more affordable housing. Um, as Nate mentioned, the, the developments proposed on two town-owned parcels. Um, CPA funds were used to determine the feasibility of affordable at the former East Street School. And in 2019, uh, Amherst Town Council voted to authorize the town manager to convey the property for um, <clears throat> affordable housing and mixed income housing purposes. At Belcher Town Road, the town of Amherst purchased the three lots in the spring of 2021 for community housing purposes under a CPA and with affordable housing trust funds and later combined the three parcels formerly 72, 76, and 80 Belcher Town Road into one parcel. And in the fall of 2021, the town issued an RFP for inviting developers to submit a vision for affordable housing mixed income housing at the former East Street School and um, Belcher Town Road in the East Village Center area. And um, Wayfinders was responded and selected as a preferred developer. The town has also developed, has supported development by providing an additional uh, million dollars in, in CPA and ARPA funds, undertaking roadway and infrastructure improvements at Belcher Town Road, funded with um, community development block grant front funds. The upgraded infrastructure will include a crosswalk in the front of the proposed development site that will cross Belcher Town Road to um, better serve the bus stop in Colonial Village across the street. Um, the town will also undertake a ecological restoration project to repair the culverts below the existing parking area at 31 Southeast Street 
And this work will include a stream channel and wetland re restoration in the rear portion of the lot. That's all, um, all wetlands and undevelopable. undevelopable. Um, so we're extremely grateful for the robust town support that we've received this far and excited to be part of this development. So um, as I mentioned, Wayfinders was selected um, as the preferred developer, a land development agreement was entered into and the town giving us site control. Um, as we work through the pre-development phase, we've worked through a lot of the environmental, um, historical and, and, and land surveying that this development will be funded by leveraging over $30 million in federal, state and local sources, primar primarily through low income housing tax credits. Um, We've we've completed phase one environmental site assessments, hazardous material surveys, wetland and resource area delineations, soil and geotechnical engineering studies, and we've uh, given notice to the Massachusetts Historical Commission and uh, completed property boundary surveys and title work as well as traffic studies. The design work has progressed far beyond the conceptual stage to arrive at the current design. Um, when we tried to, uh, you know, engage the town and community as we did that. And we've had multiple meetings with town staff, um, town department heads, including the fire department, engineering department, building department, conservation agent, and the planning staff. We've also given um, additional presentations to the Amer Amherst Historical Commission, um, the previous planning board, uh, presentation, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust reached out to neighbors and abutters, and um, we helped to give some, you know, additional information sessions um, so that we could get feedback and recommendations and, um, you know, incorporate them into the design. Um, the most notable comments that we did receive allowed us to make, and that was from the planning board, allowed us to make the significant changes to Belcher Town Road, the aesthetics, and, um, you know, re review uh, many of the items that were discussed in that meeting um, prior to us submitting the comp permit. So just to remind you, here's Amherst Center, um, the 31 Southeast Street is, um, it's two sites, um, they're both located in the East Village uh, Center, and um, you know there, there are restaurants, convenience stores, and coffee shops, along with other businesses and services. And it's um, it's also just a short walk to downtown Amherst, where there are many amenities and services. Um, each site is conveniently located adjacent to a PVTA bus stop. Um, the Route 30 bus provides regular daily service between Old Belchertown Road and Puffton Village via Amherst Downtown Common and uh, UMass Campus. There's also a Valley Bike Share Hub at the intersection of College Street and um, Belchertown Road, just a few minute walk from each site. And um, as noted earlier, the construction along Belchertown Road includes, that's, that's occurring right now, um, includes the installation of a new crosswalk in front of the proposed development, and this will create a direct path um, to the to the bus stop right here. And here's the the actual bus route. So you have 31 Southeast Street and a bus stop right there, and then 70 Belcher Town Road is going to be proposed right here with the bus stop right across the street. Um, the zoning, um, the East Street sites in the um, residential RVC Village Center Residential Zoning District. An immediate neighborhood includes both single family, multifamily homes that are owner occupied, tenant occupied. Additionally, there's lots and farms nearby contributing to the residential density of the area. Um, the neighborhood also features a variety of other property uses, such as religious organization. Uh, several small commercial office buildings that provide local business services and the Fort River Elementary School is also um, across the street here. Uh, the 70 Belcher Town Road site is located within the residential district RN uh, neighborhood residence and the portion of the site that will remain undeveloped is located within the resource protection district uh, flood prone conservancy zone. Um, this site is surrounded by a mix of single and multifamily residences, including Colonial Village um, across the street with many amenities nearby, such as a bank, auto repair shop, convenience store, and gas station. 
here's the aerial map, here's the, the school and um, Southeast Street. This is the front portion of the lot. And then here's the 70 Belcher Town Road site here. Here's 31 Southeast Street. We have the existing school that we're um, going to, you know, restore the exterior and replace all the windows. And 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 um, as part of the project, this is the existing school site, the front portion that that'll be developed on the lot over here. And this is the existing Belcher Town Road site. The building will be sited along the road and out front with the parking in the rear of the building, which will be back here. And the building will be kind of up front and around the corner. Um, there's two single family homes on there that'll be um, removed as part of the project. So the plans, um, they have incorporated many features. They'll provide uh, much needed affordable housing while minimizing the effects on the environment and surrounding community. In order to maximize the housing provided, we looked um, to most efficiently use the buildable area at each site. Our plans include buildings that will provide barrier-free housing and elevator access to all floors and units. The buildings will be designed and built with sustainability as a core goal and incorporate energy efficiency measures consistent, consistent with passive house and enterprise green communities. The buildings will be all electric and will seek to install um, solar arrays for on-site renewable energy. Our development will also have an on-site property manager or management um, allowing for a meaningful presence. So here's a 31 Southeast Street School and it's gonna create 31 um, units with a, mi a mix ranging from studios to three bedrooms, from a studio to three bedrooms. Um, it'll include the adaptive reuse of the existing school into six apartments, um, also including a common laundry room and indoor bike storage. The new construction addition will create 25 units and will include, include an on-site office and a community room for residents to use. The community room would be out in this front portion of the area, and um, there's a courtyard um, in between. The existing school is sort of set back. And the portion that allowed for the construction on the site was up, you know, along the road here. So we included a, uh, a, a courtyard there to preserve the, um, the view of the site. Um, at, the, at the planning board um, the meeting, um, there was comments on the architecture, the visibility of the historic school, the connection to the street. And also we were asked to kind of look at the, you know, if we could possibly add additional units as well as uh, um, discussing the circulation of traffic and pedestrians. Um, we responded to all of these um, directly in the comments received by the board in our comprehensive permit application to the town. But for the architecture, we worked with the design team um, to further refine the aesthetics to include a more pronounced pedestrian entrance um, from South East Street. Um, and we uh, removed a covered concrete area that was sort of like a front porch while um, retaining an architectural roof element to break up the massing. And that it allowed us to, you know, put some additional plantings and, and that sort of thing in the, in the front of the building. Um, the area new construction um, will be focused on the front of the site. Um, and, and that's mainly to preserve the wetlands um, that are in the, uh, in the rear of the parcel. And then, you know, our, our team looked at adding additional units, um, but the building was kept to two and three stories tall to keep um, the overall scale of the building in line with the surrounding neighborhood uh, context. And the uh, design includes elements such as, you know, articulated facade with bays and dormers under composition of hipped and gable roofs uh, to maintain this theme. Um, Wayfinders performed a parking study and determined the proposed parking is appropriate to meet the de demands of the site, you know, based upon the parking data from other Wayfinders properties, the availability of on-site and on-street parking, and the ease of access to other modes of transportation. Um, for pedestrian access and circulation, the town, uh, we understand the town studying Southeast Street and considering installing sidewalks and crosswalks to provide better access to the new school. 
And um, as I mentioned, the Southeast Street, the parking and the driveway will remain in a similar location um, to the existing parking. Um, the addition will be along the road and um, the plantings have been incorporated in the front of the, um, uh, in between the road and the, in the building. And, and this is the, the wetland line is this. So the existing, the existing parking area and driveways back here and that um, ecological restoration area will be within the wetlands area. And I think the conservation commission and, or conservation agent in the town is um, working on that. Now I'll switch to uh, the Belcher Town Road. Um, this will be entirely new construction. And uh, as you can see, if you remember in, in direct response to the planning board comments, our design team worked diligently to create a more elegant um, uh, design with aesthetic improvements to enhance the look and feel of the building um, prior to us um, issuing our comprehensive permit application. I know um, following that meeting, we had we had sort of weekly meetings, we met with town staff, we met with our architects and engineers to kind of, you know, really work through this. And we wanted to get this, um, you know, get this, get this up to what the, um, you know, the, the, the town, the town really, really liked and, and, and would, um, you know, took those comments very seriously. So, you know, we, we added details and they included cladding, material changes, horizontal banding, some peak dormers and bays to create a more interesting facade. Um, it encompasses both the traditional and modern elements uh, while complementing each other in the harmony with the surrounding neighborhood. Um, this, the three-story building will create 47 units with a mix of units ranging from studios to three bedrooms. Similar to the East Street School, the elevator access um, will be provided to all levels and will provide indoor bike storage, laundry room, and community room for the residents um, in addition to a management office. Um, additional planning comments from the planning board included a front setback distance, a connection to the street, and uh, the investigation of adding additional units or, or stories. You know, our design team assessed different options to move the building further from the road, you know, at the suggestion of the planning board and found that moving the building would reduce the access and circulation um, around the building and would reduce the courtyard area in the rear of the building designated for kind of outdoor use by the residents and require the site improvements to be pushed closer to the wetland area in, in the rear of the site. So, um, you know, our team's confident that the building is being built to the passive house standards with super insulated walls and triple pane windows and provide a serene environment uh, within the housing units um, that, that will not be adversely impacted by vehicular traffic on Belcher Town Road. Although many residents are expected to enter the building from the, the parking lot at the rear, the covered um, front entrance um, you know, welcomes pedestrians and bike riders approaching the building. Um, the design team redesigned the walkways in the front to be more welcoming for this type of traffic and changes in materials and colors of the covered front entry um, to further accentuate the entrance. The design team also looked at, um, you know, different options for variations in roof form, facade articulation, fenestration organization, and selective cladding variations the lap siding, board and batten, architectural paneling, all to help reduce the building scale. Um, where the facing Route 9, the building's primary roof lines reach down to two-story height to match the surrounding um, area and neighborhood, um, um, keeping it. And uh, we also looked at adding some additional units, but um, this seemed to, we kept it, um, as as it was originally and um, just to keep with the height and everything um, of the building. So there's 47 units and um, we did make a, a slight adjustment after our initial um, zoning board of appeals meeting and we added um, six additional parking spaces in the rear and um, just for some kind of overflow parking and, and here's a site plan of that. So here's Belcher Town Road across the front, the, 
the uh, parking area in the rear will be accessed via the the driveway. The um, dumpsters will be screened with like a like a, a wood um, kind of cedar type uh, fence around that. And um, what we changed was is we had a very large drop off area, and um, without really impacting the impervious area, kind of keeping it the same, we decided to. Um, Re reduce that and add some sort of overflow parking spaces here. So we're able to add six spaces kind of within the same amount um, of, you know, original footprint, which would um, give us, you know, the potential to have a few different drop off um, spaces and, and as well as, um, you know, we could have some overflow parking. And the, the wetlands are in the rear of the site, and there's the um, the stormwater basin in the in in the, in the back as well. And it's going to be um, landscaped around along here to provide a, a a buffer to the resource area. So just to give you um, income restrictions and affordable housing are all based on area median income levels or AMI. Um, these these might be you might be familiar with these, but these are a few examples of the income limits um, for various household sizes um, within the, within the, this area. Um, so currently, uh, sixty percent area median income for a family of four in our region region is around uh, sixty five thousand uh, seven hundred dollars. So, um, which is which is right here, and so the apartments will be rented to a mix of between 30, you know, 30 or less or 50 or less, 60 less, 80%, and then market rate is um, unrestricted. So here are just some rent tiers that are kind of calculated based on today's numbers. As Nate said, that this is you probably won't be in for construction for a couple of years. So without, you know, residents moving in, so these numbers may change, but all of the rents will at Wayfinders, at this Wayfinders property will are intended to include heating, cooling, electric, and, and uh, hot water. And here's the overall mix. So 23 of the, of the units, and they'll be, they'll be split up between one bedrooms and two bedrooms and three bedrooms. Um, so we'll have 23 units at 30% AMI or less. We'll have another seven units or 50% of AMI or less. And then um, 19 units at 60% AMI or less or 80% 80, 80 units. Um, we'll have 19 of those. And then we'll have 10 market rate units at uh, the Southeast Street site. And then here, here are how the income mixes follow at, at each site individually. And then right now we're in the permitting phase and um, that started when our project eligibility application went into the executive office of the housing and livable communities um, in the er earlier this year. And during that process is when it was presented to the town and we were able to give that presentation to the um, planning board when it was out for public comment, the initial public comment. Um, during this phase, we also presented to the Hors Historic Commission and hosted an independent online information session. And uh, yet yeah, we, we incorporated a lot of that feedback into the design. Um, and then we were issued our project eligibility letter in June, which allowed us to put in our, be eligible to put in our application for a comprehensive permit um, through the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, according to the project eligibility letter that, um, from EOHLCs, the findings included, among other things, that the proposed project appears generally eligible under the requirements of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. The proposed housing design is appropriate for the sites, and the proposed project appears financially feasible in the context of the Amherst um, housing market. Uh, we anticipate uh, permitting will run through the fall and wrap up in early winter and be fully per permanent prior to our submission of this year's state's funding round that typically occurs in January or February. 
Um, due to the competitive funding round process, we expect the financing to be complete, leading the development into construction into 2027. So around this time. Um, from there, we expect an 18 month construction period wrapping up and being fully leased in 2028 and managed by our property management division. He said uh, Wayfinders professionally manages over 800 affordable rental home units in uh, communities across Western and Central Massachusetts. And we have culturally diverse portfolio of properties um, that address the needs of specific demographics like older adults, low income families, people with disabilities. We offer a range of apartment options for sing from single room occupancy to four bedroom apartments. Our property management and residential, residential service teams work closely to create a positive and productive relationships with our residents. And the result of this collaboration is a genuine sense of community um, through social activities, workshops, meetings, and services. Um, and uh, the permitting, the sites are being permanently permitted concurrently with the Conservation Commission due to the wetland resources on each site, and we'll work with both the, um, the commission and the ZBA throughout the permitting process. So the town's zoning does not currently allow for the proposed density of the apartment buildings. So a comprehensive permit is, is sought, in, including um, some waivers of uh, the development. Yeah, and that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions and Jamie, before we take questions, I just want to um, highlight one thing. I think uh, the members of the commission remember our last meeting and we received <clears throat> a lot of um, very pointed uh, comments, especially about the Belchertown Road site. Um, and Jamie said we've made those changes. So I don't um, know if people went back and looked at it, but I, I think it might be interesting to quickly show what we showed you like three months ago compared to what we have today. Would you like me to just pop that on the screen for a second? Because it's really, uh, you know, this was sort of a long presentation, but there was one very dramatic. Uh, Jimmy, I'll, I'll pull, let me okay. show my screen. Yeah, Bruce, I, I appreciate your thinking of that. I, that had gone through my head. It has okay. been several months and okay. it's hard to remember exactly okay. what we saw. So I'm gonna share now. Um, So can people see this? Yeah. Yes. So that's what you looked at a few months ago. People remember that well, I'm sure. <laughs> um, we got a lot of comments. Uh, I think we call them criticisms. Um, and they were good comments. And, you know, I'll, 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 <laughs> I have no shame in saying you guys were right. Um, and it was... Um, really good to get that feedback because then we made a change and here can people see the the new design now yeah yep. okay so there's one ah okay we don't have to look at that the changes here it's not just that we've sort of turned this sort of you know i'll say poorly executed modern version of something into something that's a little bit more traditional, but it's not purely traditional, clearly. Um, and uh, but it fits into the context of of the Emmers community, we believe much better. Um, it's the way that the mass is broken up with different um, design elements and colors, uh, um, roof pitches, not just on the front, but along the, the driveway side of the building is not this one kind of undifferentiated mass, but we've broken that up. And the other major change here is to the front entrance. We received comments on both properties about the, you know, the how the front of the building and the entrance really address the street. And, uh, you know, we've, you know, created a more substantial front porch area. And instead of having just a straight sidewalk coming out perpendicular from the building to the street, we created this, it's not a uh, arched driveway, but it's an arched walkway that really connects 
uh, people walking down the street and the bus stop and the people across the street really connect into the site and uh, so that the front of the building really feels like it's it's um, it's reaching out to the rest of the Belchertown Road um, street. So I just, you know, just thought it was worth really looking at the before and after. And I just want to sort of thank the commission for its comments a few months ago, because we think that this is also a much better project. And um, I'm hoping that you do too. That's all. Oh, thank you, Bruce. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Is it okay if I stop sharing? What's that? Can I stop sharing now? Sure, sure. Okay. Although we may we may want to bring that rendering back depending on the comments we get. But okay. uh, thank you for bringing, bringing the before up and uh, your gracious uh, acceptance of our comments. I do remember that meeting was pretty pointed. Okay, board members. Um, are we all mollified? Are we silent tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Karen. Yes, so kudos. It's beautiful what you've done. I'm very impressed and I'm grateful. Um, it's an exciting project. Every 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 phase of what you have explained, I just kept thinking, yes, that sounds great. That sounds really good. So um, yeah, I'm 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 very impressed. Uh, I just wanted to again to say, I, I like the fact that you said, okay, then this is welcoming and people will be coming on bicycles and walking. And so you have to plan for that and have some bicycle rack, a place for the bicycle rack so that you, they can really put their bicycle, park it there and come in that way. Mm -hmm. And just keep thinking of that we're transitioning more and more, hopefully, in the center of town, and this is going to be also the center of town and close to elementary schools, just finding a way to have kind of dedicated bicycle routes uh, so that people with children feel safe going by bicycle and leaving their bicycle somewhere. So keep keep working on, on that, I guess. Yeah, but let me say it's not highly visible <laughs> in this rendering, or uh, you're not looking at the rendering anymore, but under that front sort of porch there is there are bicycle racks there's also bicycle racks in the rear of the building and then there's indoor bicycle parking i think there's one indoor bicycle uh, uh indoor bicycle spot for every unit so i think we have about 48 indoor units or, or bicycle parking spaces and we do a bike racks front and back so we absolutely amazing thank you yeah all right Bruce, I saw. thought I saw your hand. Um, yes, you did. I, 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 uh, as, uh, this is, I agree with Karen. This is uh, really quite a substantial uh, change, particularly the Belchertown Road. I, I looked at the, uh, uh, the E Street uh, project as well. And uh, I remember, Doug, you had some uh, rather uh, interesting observations there about making the, uh, the uh, the school be more visible. I'll be interested to hear what you think uh, about the 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 the, the changed uh, or, or the current version of that scheme. Um, I'll focus on the Belchertown Road um, scheme. Um, I think it's it's really heartening to think that uh, that uh, since you did provide us with the uh, material first, we looked at it both before the meeting and during the meeting. We discussed it. Uh, you heard us clearly, uh, and uh, Bruce, you just mentioned that you thanked us for the thought and whatever uh, conversation we had about it. it it's uh, unusual. It's 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 rare actually that I feel as a member of this board that we've actually made some noticeable contribution to the community. <laughs> it's, you, it's a bit like you throw balls in the bushes and hope that uh, the dog finds them, you know, but in this case, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it seems to be pretty clear that uh, our time spent with you was very well spent. And I appreciate that and, and uh, feel good on behalf of my colleagues here. Um, so yes, many of the things that you've mentioned seem to make so much more sense. Um, I had a, uh, I think you balanced the front setback. I, I can see 
uh, we did push, I know I particularly was arguing for pushing the building back and so forth, but it seems that you've you've uh, gone through an exercise that uh, recognizes the forces that are pushing the building forward from the back and the forces that are pushing the building back from the front. And, and, and it seems that uh, you've, you've achieved an equilibrium, a thoughtful equilibrium there. And, and uh, I appreciate uh, that effort. Um, the, uh, the better front is clearly more welcoming. I, the columns there, you've got double columns. I always think that's a friendly thing to do. Um, uh, to, uh, it's a good way of making a, a building look, uh, uh, an entrance, an entrance uh, porch and so forth, have a presence without it being too heavy. So I like the way you did that. Um, I note that the sidewalk is uh, on on the uh, on your side of the road. You show it right on the road, um, and I also note that there's a sidewalk that is shown on the opposite side of the road, and I see there's a pedestrian crossing that runs. So it looks as though uh, the belt the belt of town road has a has has a sidewalk on one side, uh, and that's uh, and so your sidewalk is really not trying to, I suppose. Uh, be something that the future would expect that that sidewalk would run all the way up to Echo Hill or what have you. But uh, it it did it did it did make me think. I, I wonder whether in the future there would be two sidewalks, one on either side of the road, and and if that was the case, uh, um, whether you might uh, not have that concrete uh, um, sidewalk right on the on the curb. That just seemed a little awkward and odd to me. I would think that see that don't have anything there or have something that's pushed back a bit. But I'll leave you to contemplate that because you're clearly good at contemplating things like this. The only thing that, uh, as a as a as a retired and one time architect, I I look at the uh, the gable and bays. What do they call them? The um, the gable bay bump outs. Um, they look like a, a good opportunity for a, a bit of contrast. You've got a contrast in tone, I notice, with, uh, and and I wondered whether it's hard to tell from the rendering whether you had intended to have any contrast in texture, but if you did and you were thinking of clabbing or something along the main uh, uh, bulk of the side of, of the facade, um, I wonder whether you might consider those uh, bump outs having a smooth or a, or a, a different texture, just to uh, so that would further soften the building. I think if there was a, a textural contrast between some parts of the building and others, and those uh, gable bay bump outs provide an excellent opportunity, it seems to me, to uh, achieve that if you chose. And the only other thing I would say, and I realize that this is uh, possibly um, uh, a little bit out of order, but nonetheless, I, 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 uh, I wondered uh, whether you had thought about those Roof lines, the, the 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 rakes of the of the of the gable bay bump outs, and then you've got little dormers next door, and the and the roof line on the on the on the rake goes down, and the dormer is 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 uh, there like that, and it seems that they want to join, they want to marry, and it seems to be uh, that the building the the contractor might even want that. It might be easier to do. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but I I wonder whether it, that would seem to simplify that. Because it's drawing the eyeball there. It's a very busy uh, uh, collision between the, the the bay, the the eaves of the dormers and the rake ends of the gables. It seems that they want to uh, enjoy a more harmonious relationship, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of what you've done, and, and and the whole damn thing, you know, with what you're providing for the town is laudable, regardless of what it looks like. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Bruce. Anybody else? Uh, okay, I'll say just a couple of things. Uh, first, thank you. I think this is this is much better. Um, I particularly think the Belchertown Road building has uh, improved a lot to the uh, uh, has improved a lot. Um, the uh, predominant change that I noticed in the rendering over at the school site was the addition of the two entrances on the street front. Um, and so I, I appreciated those. And I think that does give the building a more neighborhood feel. And uh, it's more welcoming and all the good feelings that, that can come from that. Um, 
Bruce, I was disappointed that the school is still behind the new building. Um, but I, I, I can't even imagine all the constraints you guys are under with this kind of project. I've never worked on one. Um, so I guess you did the best you could and that's what you had to do with the site you had. Um, but, uh, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda. Um, the Belchertown site, uh, I also agree is much better. Um, I, I really like what you did with the, what Bruce called the gabled bump outs at the east end of the facade. Um, the west end, that, that sort of end view uh, still feels kind of plain to me. I'd really like to see a, a gabled bump out on that. Uh, I'd actually like to see a symmetric uh, roof line on that rather than the off, you know, the asymmetric roof line. Um, I think that would be more palatable and feel less modern and sort of a non-traditional. Um, and I think that's the kind of look that this town uh, really enjoys. Uh, they, this town doesn't really appreciate modernism as much as some of us architects do. Um, uh, I agree with Bruce about maybe trying to change the pattern or the, the texture of the gables. Uh, shingling came to mind. I know that's more labor intensive, but maybe you can get prefabricated, uh, you know, eight by four by eight sheets of shingles that you can apply uh, as opposed to the clabbered that's typical everywhere else. Or, or try some vertical board and batten pattern as opposed to the vertical. Um, color, you know, the white and the gray just feels a little bit, I don't know what, whether it's plain or it's commercial or what, but I hope the colors feel a little more, a little richer or a little bit more uh, inviting. I don't know what else to say. Um, you answered my question about the bike racks in Belchertown. I'm glad to, that there's some under the under the porch. Um, I just wondered about electric vehicle chargers. Uh, hopefully, even people who need affordable housing will eventually be able to own an electric vehicle. Um, I hope you're at least putting some conduit in the ground now, um, even if you're not putting in the chargers. And um, I, I felt like I, mean, I either lost my concentration or you skipped over the, the slide for the unit breakdown of, of Belchertown Road. I just wanted to know how many market rate units are at Belchertown Road as opposed to the, in comparison to the overall units in that uh, building. Yeah, and I can, I can bring that slide back up. And um, there's actually, I, oh. I, I thought I heard 10 units at the Southeast Street were, were market rate, but I didn't hear how many were market rate at Belchertown. So at Belchertown Road, um, here, I'll just share my screen. Let's see, share screen. There you go. So are you able to see that? Yep. Oh, okay. okay, so there aren't any. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. And and the um the the, the because the um the properties were purchased for affordable housing with affordable housing trust funds, um in through in CPA money through the town, um it has an affordability restriction on it, um that would limit it to I I believe it's it's either eighty or a hundred percent AMI units. So all of the units will be um, considered affordable there at 80%. Um, AMI will have an income restriction on them. Okay. And um, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's really all I had to say. Um, I'll just a final response on all the design comments. Obviously we listen, you know, we take all of your comments seriously. Um, I won't respond to any of the individual comments, but uh, some of them are things we thought about, like such as color. You know, those are not final colors, but they're kind of indicative of the direction that we're heading. Um, we'll 
you know, in the issue about like the different differentiation of the textures, you know, we've that conversation has come up on our design team. So we're aware of this. We'll make changes. I know Jamie's been taking notes uh, where we can make changes that are, you know, will produce, you know, better design. We'll make, we won't be able to make all the changes uh, of, of the suggestions that we've heard, but, um, you know, it's a shared goal to make this look and feel and be as useful to everybody um, as possible. So thank you again for your comments tonight. All right. Chris. I just wanted to say, um, well, first of all, it, it really was improved tremendously and I appreciate all the hard work that you went through, but I wanted to comment on a detail, which is that Belcher Town Road in terms of its sidewalks is a town project and the town is now working on it. And there's not really anything that um, wayfinders can do about that. And I don't know for sure whether the sidewalk is right up against the curb, but I suspect it is because there's not a lot of room to work with there. So anyway, I just wanted to say wayfinders doesn't have any control over the sidewalks on Belcher Town Road. Thank you. And thanks for doing such a great job. Thank you. Yeah, and I can just, I do know at Belcher Town Road that they are, there is a proposed, there is, they widened it slightly to include room for a dedicated bike lane. So the sidewalk got pushed back a little bit um, to the property line in order to make room for that um, bike lane along the along Route 9 there. Great. Now Karen can bicycle to Belchertown. Okay, so, uh, you know, our comments this evening were pretty modest. Um, I'm not even sure we do we need a, a letter of recommendation to ZBA or or not. I think no, Bruce, I, mean, Bruce, I think we can summarize the conversation and provide you know a summary to the zoning board. I, I think that's fine. I, you know there wasn't any to me there wasn't right anything that uh, needed a kind of a formal motion or or discussion. So okay, yeah. Well, you can just lift whatever shows up in the minutes and put it in a letter. Okay, well, thank you, James and Bruce, and good luck with this really long process. Yeah, we really appreciate your support and yeah. glad to be back here. Thank you. Yeah, very much. Thank you very much. Okay, time now is 9.28. And the next item on our agenda is planning board elections and reorganization. Um, Lawrence, you have we waited we waited for you to arrive so that we could all be here to talk about election of our officers, which is a chair, a vice chair, and I'm blanking on the third one. Somebody clerk. Has, clerk. Clerk. There we go. The the clerk who typically doesn't have to do any minutes. Um, but if you know they're third in line in case the chair and the vice chair are not able to uh, chair the meeting, um, we have had instances where we needed to help staff produce minutes. Um, and at least at that point, we distributed that load rather than just dumping it all on the clerk. Um, so those are three officers, offices. And then we need to talk about the representatives from the planning board to the uh, subcommittees that we are, we, we participate in outside of planning board. So um, I guess we ought to just start. Uh, I saw a hand a minute ago. I think it was from you, Lawrence. Um, but maybe it was, not. I, I did. I didn't mean to raise my hand. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so why don't we start and take nominations for chair? Does anybody want to do it? Does anybody want someone else to do it? Johanna. I nominate that Doug Marshall continue as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board. <laughs> okay, uh, Bruce. I so second. You so second. Okay. Are there other candidates who want to come forward or want to be pushed forward? 
no. Okay. I suppose we ought to officially vote these things, Chris or Nate. Have yes. to have to roll th run through yes. the roll call again. Yes, please. Yes. All right. So for Doug Marshall for chair for another year. Um, a yes vote is in favor and a no votes against. Bruce? Yes. Fred? Aye. Jesse? Yes, and thank you. Uh, Lawrence? Yes. Johanna? Aye. Karen? Yes. And I will abstain on that one. But it's clear I uh, am elected to another year of this immensely powerful position. Thank All you. All right. Um, next, we need a vice chair. And uh, obviously, I think the most important role of that is when I get sick or hit by a bus or whatever, you guys are you're ready to jump in and be chair. So, Johanna, you have been our chair our vice chair, um, would you be willing to be another, to be a vice chair again? I would. All right, so I will nominate Johanna for vice chair. Are there other nominations or seconds of that nomination? Jesse. I'll second Johanna's nomination. All right, anybody else want to be part of the mix and make it a, Contested vote. All right, we'll run through the roll call again, starting this time with Karen. Karen? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Johanna? Who will abstain? All right. Lawrence? Yes. And Jesse? Yes. Fred. Yes. And Bruce. Yep. Okay, and I'm a yes too. So another six in favor, one abstention. And last, our clerk. And I, forgive me, whoever's been clerk. Who has Bruce. been clerk? Mr. Coldham. Mr. Coldham. Ah, yes. I had no idea. <laughs> that's why I, that reminds me. That's why we had you chair one of the meetings in our in mm -hmm. August. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Does anybody else want to be clerk, or does is Bruce? Are you willing to continue? All right. It's obviously weighed heavily on your mind. Okay. So uh, going through the roll call again, Bruce. Excuse me, are you nominating oh. Bruce? Yeah. I'll nominate Bruce. All right. Bruce. <laughs> and then I'll someone second. has to second. And I will I'll second that. All right. <laughs> Jesse, Jesse can second. All right. So this time we'll start with Fred. Aye. And Jesse. Aye. And Lawrence. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Aye. I'm an aye. And Bruce. You know what? I'm I'm in spite of nominating myself, I'm going to abstain. <laughs> All right. Well, you you've got the job anyway. All right, six in favor, one abstention. We have officers for our next year. Mm -hmm. All right. Um now yeah. we need to talk about the the board yeah. and liaison committees that we serve on. So we've got Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, this Community Preservation Act Committee, the Design Review Board, and uh, I guess that's those are the primary three. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we start with PVPC, Bruce? That's been you. I'm I'm happy to continue, and uh, this, and perhaps even especially because the next meeting is uh, it's actually a face to face meeting at the South Hadley Boathouse or something like that. I I 
this is a group of about 40 people. It's uh, the most uh, weird uh, Zoom meeting I ever participate in with alternates and commissioners and uh, various others. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how tall these people are or how short they are. So if you if you're all willing, I'll continue. Okay. Is anybody else really itching to get to know the PVPC? Doesn't sound like it. Okay. Um, Chris, do we need formal nominations and votes for these I think as so. well? Yeah. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'll nominate Bruce for the PVPC liaison. Jesse raised two fingers to indicate okay. seconded. All right, um, I'm gonna see if I can get away with simplifying this. Does anybody object to this nomination? As no objections. So Chris, that's uh, unanimous, unless Bruce wants to abstain. We could say by consensus. By consensus, that sounds- Yes, do it that way, that's easier. Sure. Um, CPAC is the next committee. And I did that last year sort of under duress because nobody else volunteered. Um, I don't really want to do it again this year. So um, I, th I think we talked a little bit about that last meeting. Lawrence, I don't know if you listened to our last meeting. Um, that, com that committee, uh, it's one of the more positive committees because they just give away money. Um, and, but they're, 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 the, they're, the period of the calendar when they have most intense meetings is through the fall, sort of October, November, and a little bit into December. So I'm hoping somebody else would like to do that. Nobody's, nobody's jumping up, huh? And I was hoping that one of our, either our new member or one of the other members would do that. Uh, well, why don't we skip that for the moment? Um, DRB has been Karen, I believe, right? And how are you feeling about that? I, I like it and I'm getting to know it and I, I would like to continue doing that. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Bruce, your hand went up. You're you're muted. I nominate Karen. All right. Uh, I guess I'll second. Anyone object to Karen doing this? Okay. All right, so we'll go back to CPAC. Anybody want to do that or willing to do that? Chris, do we need to, do we have to nominate someone? Nate would know, he goes to their meetings. It'd be a vacancy, um, you know, it's, it would be important. I think if it didn't happen tonight, the proposals are due September at the end of the month. And as Doug mentioned, they, you know, it's a short window, but they meet uh, fairly often beginning in October. You know, they probably have eight meetings between October 1 and end of December. Uh, they review proposals, they hold hearings, and they recommend, you know, the funding allocation that then goes to uh, the finance committee and the town council for approval. So what the CPA committee does is it looks at the proposals coming in for open space, recreation, housing, and historic preservation. They hear presentations, they ask questions, and then they recommend those proposals. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think if, if if not at this meeting, then I think the next planning board meeting, it would probably be asked from the town manager's office if there would be a planning board member. Um, they try to like to have, you know, every, you know, it's a, it's a CPA committee is made up mostly of representatives from other boards and committees, and then a few at-large members. And so they really like to have a full complement, especially at the beginning of uh, the review cycle. So we could, we could wait. I mean, there's still some time, but you know, if you have any questions, you could reach out to Doug. He served, you could ask, ask me, um, you know, 
time commitments and other things, but you know, if there's anything there. Doug, I'd be, I, oh, sorry. Well, Johanna has her hand up. I don't know, Lawrence. If, go I, ahead. Lawrence, why don't you go ahead and then I can chime in. Well, I was going to say, if, if nobody steps forward, I'd, I'd be happy to have a conversation, Doug, with you and Nate about it. Just, I, I want to know um, what the time commitments are since I'm already sort of, uh, approaching limit having a having a young toddler in the house um uh in terms of time I can offer but it, it sounds like interesting work and something I might consider but um I'd want to okay. be pretty clear about what the demands are okay well uh Johanna and then the thing that I was going to say I, I think this would be an incredibly rewarding board to serve on and I think these grants really do make a big impact on the quality of the town and then, and I, I feel like Doug, you took the hit last year and you already do a lot of service on this board. And so I feel like if others can pick up that lift, that would be awesome. Um, I just agreed to coach the middle school ultimate program through the beginning of November, which is also just a massive time commitment. So given that that like peak demand on that is basically, I think, overlaps with this um i think i could be like you know an in absentia member through october which i recognize is kind of when most of the work happens but then afterwards you know in november and december could help usher it through but i i think it would be better to have somebody who's you know committed through the full arc yeah i i, I found last year first of all by us waiting until september to, to uh to make these nominations, we sometimes, I, I missed a couple of meetings at the beginning. So I kind of came in a little bit behind the curve. Um, and then they did meet mostly every week and usually on Thursday evenings, um, I think starting at seven and usually not more than an hour and a half usually, I think. Uh, there was some reading outside of the meetings uh, because you 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 get these applications for funding and you got to read the application. Um, most many of the applications were from town entities, whether it's public works or conservation wants to build a new hiking trail or whatever. Some of them were nonprofits. Uh, some of it's historical. So I, uh, Lawrence, I can talk to you more later, but. Um, you know, it seemed like a, a good thing to do. It's money that needs to, that really needs to get doled out. Um, but um, I, I don't feel like I should do it again this year. Yeah, I mean, I will say that uh, proposals are due at uh, the end of the month and then there's a an internal staff review. They get um, sent to the committee, the CPA committee members, the committee members need to review them individually and send questions back to staff and then staff sends those to the applicants and then the committee will meet uh, starting usually in like mid to late October. So usually there's maybe one meeting in October. And then I, I agree with Doug that it's usually, you know, probably every week uh, through November and then, and then a few weeks into December. So, uh, you know, like one or two meetings in October, four in November and three in December. That's, you know, they, and over those course of those meetings, they they ask applicants for presentations. There's a public hearing, and then they discuss, you know, like I said, the funding amounts and what you know. Lately, they're getting requested uh, more proposals come in in terms of dollar amount than they can fund, so they have to make decisions about you know what is the you know how much do they fund each project or do they fund all projects? And so, um, yeah, I mean it's, it's becoming. I think more of a sought after source. It, it does fund a lot of good projects around town. Uh, they all need to have that come some public benefit in their respective categories. So, you know, historic preservation is, you know, can be used for private projects as well as public and it goes for all the rest of uh, those categories. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a feel good thing. It, it does just take a lot of work. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly open to considering it, but I, I, I can't really commit to it tonight. So I um, uh, would, would love to have a follow up conversation um okay. with you all if that's okay yep um, all right all right so we will postpone that 
nomination till next time. Um, why don't we go ahead further through the agenda? Next item time now is 946. Chris and or Nate or Pam, old business topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. I don't have anything. Okay. Um, new business not reasonably anticipated. Nothing. Okay, Form A, A&R subdivision applications. No, not tonight, but we will next time. Okay. Upcoming ZBA applications. Um, I actually talked with uh, Jacinta and she said she has things out there on the wings. Nothing has been submitted. So they could continue with their uh, public hearing for the wayfinders. Okay. Upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. We Pam do. knows more about it than I do. Maybe Pam should report. Well, uh, we have received a site plan review application for 45 and 55 South Pleasant Street. Um, the projects that Barry Roberts is doing with um, that incorporates the Hastings building. Um, they're coming back before the board. They have some changes they would like to make to conditions. Um, and then they are, uh, they have reduced the number of electrical meters and they have slightly relocated the transformers. So <clears throat> that is expected to come to the board on October 16th. Okay. Which I think is our next meeting, right? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, now planning board committee and liaison reports. Uh, I guess looks like we start with Jesse. Housing subcommittee, any anything new from you guys? Nope, we, have, we haven't met since the last meeting. We meet next okay. week. All right. Bruce? Although I will chime in, we were meeting with staff to talk about um, you know, a few things the committee uh, discussed. And Jesse, I... Um, we sent around emails to schedule a time. I, I think I was on, I dropped the ball there. Um, so I, I'll just follow up. Everyone was available at some, you know, it's hard to get a, a time when four people can meet together, but I think we had some. So I'll, I'll just get that going in the next week and a half. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, Bruce, PVPC. Uh, not, nothing to report. All right. Uh, I don't have anything for CPAC. Uh, Karen, DRB. No, we meet next week. Okay. And either Chris or Nate for CRC. Chris, you're muted. Yes. Um, the CRC is still working on the solar bylaw. Um, Stephanie Ciccarillo is going to take over most of that work, but I'll be helping her a little bit. Um, and I don't know if they did have it on their agenda for this coming Tuesday, but I don't know if we'll actually be able to talk, talk about it then because, well, that's all. <laughs> uh, and sort of on the same similar topic, uh, am I correct that the over the draft overlay zoning proposal has gone to town council and will be on one of their October meeting agendas? Yes, it's gone to town council and it may come to the town council on the um, 23rd of September, which would be this coming Monday. Um, they have to make that decision. If it's not on the 23rd, it would be on October 7th. Okay. And then and then they, assuming they vote it to refer it, it will go to CRC and to us for hearings. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yep. Okay. So that could conceivably be in October, right? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, report of chair, time now is 9.50. Um, the one thing I was gonna bring up that I mentioned earlier uh, is whether we ought to try to meet in person a little bit more than we have. Um, about a year ago when we were working on the 
sort of the housing overlay early conversations we met at, as an additional meeting uh, for three or four times once a month through the fall. And I thought it was productive to get in the same room with you all. And um, I think in Bruce's words, see how tall you are. Um, so, um, you know, I wondered, we, we don't have to decide anything tonight, but I was gonna just suggest, well, maybe we should have one of our meetings each month in person for, you know, starting in January for six months or something like that, just to see how it works. Because um, it's a change not only for us, but it's, you know, the applicants have to show up and they're, they're out of the habit of driving into town just like we are. Um, so, uh, Jesse? I was just wondering, so I haven't been on the board for in-person very much at all. How do the presentations work in person? Like that's what's really nice about Zoom, right? We can see the slides, yeah. whatever. So how did that work before? Was it printed copies? Was it on screen? Like what it was, was the on, form? It was on screen mostly. Yeah. No, I mean, I would, we... I mean, so personally, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I think the housing discussions in person as an extra meeting were helpful, but to go back to in person, the recommendation actually is to stay hybrid or to stay remote. Um, I think having applicants come into town hall is going to make it really difficult. It'll take more staff time. We'll have to set it up as a hybrid meeting. And I actually think the presentations will be less visible and less legible for the planning board, the public, and those watching at home. And so to me, I don't, I'm not sure that I don't see a benefit going to in-person to have public hearings or those types of things. So like what we did tonight, you can annotate on a screen with Zoom, we can zoom in, we can make things really clear and visible. And so I actually would, you know, personally, and then also for staff time, uh, it's a hardship for me, right? I mean, so work-life balance, I coach year round, uh, you know, and so I can make it on Zoom. To be in person means I have to really rearrange my schedule. And I find that those meetings are not as necessarily effective as, or any more effective, actually probably less effective than Zoom. And so I'm, I'm a big proponent of remote meetings. I think in-person, you know, is really helpful when we're talking about the zoning amendment and a specific topic, but not bringing applicants in uh, to give presentations. Okay. Any, any other opinions or comments? Uh, Karen and then Chris. Um, I agree. It's a hardship for staff and it's kind of nice to be able to come remotely when you're all over the place. But it would be really nice to, to schedule, maybe not once a month, but sometimes it's good to, to get together and maybe it would be for a topic to, if we're gonna do the the um, rezoning of university driver or, or just some issue that we care about. I still care about, um, communicating better with UMass on housing and things like that, that we have at some point every two months or three months, a time when we can get together. It, it just builds a, um, an understanding between us. It's just, it's a valuable thing. And, the, and, and we should do it rarely because of the commitment of staff and everyone else, but we should somehow try to figure a way that we can get together in person. All right, thanks, Karen. Chris? I just wanted to say that I think my leaving, uh, my retiring is going to put an extra strain on the staff who's here. Um, we're hoping to hire another planner soon, but um, she'll be taking up the slack with work that, um, you know, that we've had a hard time getting done even with the staff that we have. So perhaps if you are contemplating this um, in-person meeting, you wait um, for a while, maybe wait until January at least to try it because I think it's gonna be a hard transition with um, with my departure and other transitions. So that's okay. just my two cents, thank you. All right, good to hear. Um, Johanna. I think there's real value to being in person. Um, I found that when we were hammering out 
the geography of which place to go deeper on rezoning on doing I couldn't imagine doing that process and having those conversations on zoom whereas I think it really worked for us to have the whiteboards up around the room and have the big maps and um so I feel like for public hearings zoom works very very well and we get great efficiencies on that I think for the like creative process of developing policy that's really great to do in person and I feel like when we were going through that process we actually added meetings um yes yes I and then I'm just trying to figure out like right now we don't have one of those projects you know like the I feel like I'm not sure maybe there's an appetite to like say all right great we've like moved forward a uh, overlay district for university drive and now that's going to go through its process so let's actually bite off the next thing um if we were ready to bite off that next thing let's say starting in january or february i'd be excited to have that conversation but i could also understand if people want to wait i don't know if that's helpful at all doug but those yeah. are yeah yeah certainly uh bruce I uh, basically agree with Karen and with uh, Johanna and also with Nate. Interesting because I was fully supportive of uh, when you first said what you said. I thought, yes, that would be great. And I found that I had my mind uh, pretty solidly turned around by what Nate said. And then uh, Karen's uh, idea seemed to be good. There's a place for this uh, and we should. And I think, Douglas Chair, given your uh, interest in this, I think we should uh, uh, charge you and ourselves, but you particularly with looking out for opportunities to do this. Uh, and uh, one final comment that it seems January in the middle of winter with snow and ice and everything seems to be is 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 when Zoom is really appealing. So that's just a thought. Okay. All right. Well. Uh, thank you all for those comments, and uh, I guess I'll think about that and talk to Nate and Chris as much as she's around, and we'll see where, where this goes. Uh, regarding, Johanna, your comment about uh, whether we're ready to bite something else off, um, you know, I kind of assumed we'd start talking about Belchertown Road and the lower end of College Street. Um, that was sort of candidate number two when we were talking about where we might uh, up zone or, or think about, you know, changing things. So, uh, you know, and maybe to avoid, well, I don't think we can do anything this fall. It feels like that, that, that's sort of uh, not going to work. And particularly hearing from Chris that, that staff needs to go through the transition period and, and get their bearings. Um, I think we probably ought to wait till next year, but uh, think about it for the early spring. Okay, uh, that's all I had. Chris or Nate, report of staff or, or Pam. Uh, I'd just like to say I've enjoyed working with you tremendously and I'll miss you all. I hope to see you around town and I'll be watching planning board meetings, um, probably to my husband's distress. But um, <laughs> when is your anyway, retirement party? Um, their party is next Thursday at two o'clock in the town room. So yeah. you're all welcome to come and it would be great to see you there. And I'll probably be crying at that party. <laughs> but anyway. It's been a, a great job, and uh, thank you very much for um, making it so pleasant. Are you right. really not going to be in town hall if we come looking for you after that date? Do well, you I'm, I'm trying to make a deal with Dave Zomek to let me come back part-time, um, and I think he's amenable to that. So we're working it out, but it would probably be 20 hours a week or something like that because but I really enjoy this work. I just can't do it at the level and intensity that I've been doing it because I'm getting old. So <laughs> anyway, it's been wonderful. So thank you. Thank you all for your part in it. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I was going to just say a few things, Johanna. Um, 
or what, what can be involved in? There's the housing production plan. So the consultants have done some outreach meetings. They're hoping to do more this fall. Uh, you know, some the previous plan looked at did look at Route Nine and a few sites, and so we've discussed having some some kind of components there. So I just you know have you know planning board stay tuned. Dodson and Flinker is getting uh, more involved with the downtown design standards in terms of outreach and trying to formulate you know draft standards over the next say six months. And so I think you know the planning board uh, members may have been asked to be part of a working group. You can always there's a web page now. Uh, and then there's opportunities for public comment. And then the planning board, along with a few others, will be involved as uh, reviewers of those standards when they're in draft form. So, you know, it'll probably be a, co a combined meeting with, like, say, planning board, DRB, ZBA, and others to try to minimize how many meetings the consultants have to go to. But, uh, you know, so I think the, the planning board will be involved there. Um, and then, you know, just a note on the University Drive overlay, there's, there was a change in state law a few years ago. And so if there's, um, it's eligible locations that are appropriate for, for infill, for mixed use, for uh, multi-unit density, then it's a simple majority vote by town council or by, you know, the legislative body. And so when University Drive gets referred, if, should it get referred, the planning board and CRC will have to discuss whether or not University Drive is an eligible location according to Mass General Law. And if so, then the, the vote to adopt it is by simple majority. And, you know, I, I think initially looking at everything it is, uh, it, to me, it means that there are other areas in town that would then also qualify as an eligible location. You know, Route 9 could be one. And honestly, I also think we could look at uh, gateway or areas around the university campus. And so, you know, if we're, you know, if we want to talk about where we have different kinds of housing, I think there can be, you know, you know, we said what the reason why Route 9 was uh, reduced as a priority was, you know, we might be able to zone it for what we might want in terms of scale and massing, but maybe the end users are not, you know, if it's going to be all students, maybe that's not what we want. And so I think there's probably places in town where we could discuss, you know, what are, you know, what are different strategies. And so I, I, my saying that is it could tie really nicely into the housing production plan and the downtown design standards. And so, you know, I, I, I'm, my guess, I think, my guess is that next spring, uh, there'll probably be a number of ideas and things that the planning board could really discuss. Uh, we're, we're talking about updating the master plan in the next few years, or maybe even getting that started at some point too, in terms of how do we scope that out? So that's something that to, you know, that'll be coming forward. And then the uh, ADU changes, uh, according to state law, we have to have a new bylaw or, you know, have everything in place by February. So, you know, at some point, staff will probably start looking at that. There's it's still not some clarity. The state put a web page up about ADUs, but I think there's a lot of complexity there in terms of, you know, what, what the statute actually means and how it's interpreted. And so that hasn't been clear yet. Uh, you know, like I said, there's a lot of, ideas at, at one of the forums workshops. And so I just, I'm not sure where that'll go, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that next year there's probably some, some good, you know, policy or, you know, regulatory things that the planning board could really discuss and maybe, you know, propose some different changes. And so I, I, I kind of like that idea, um, move some things forward. Okay. I, I, I just want to note that uh, Lawrence has left the meeting sometime in the mm -hmm. last few minutes. Uh, Johanna. I think that's a really exciting kind of policy agenda to explore. And that's the kind of work that I think doing in person is going to be more productive than trying to do it over Zoom. OK. Do, Anything? Do, Go ahead. Do we need to mention that our next meeting starts at 7 versus 6.30? Does everybody know that? No, we we were we were going to mention that a there is no meeting on October third or whatever the very right. first week of October uh, because it conflicts with Rosh Hashanah, and so our next meeting is is it October sixteenth? October sixteenth. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
And um, because uh, Nate has some obligations and can't really participate until about seven, uh, I thought we were gonna try starting at 645 and do a few of our administrative things before we before we before Nate before Nate arrives. We can. So let's try that and see if we can keep that 15 minutes as a productive period. Okay. Um, if we can't, then we can talk about starting later. But you know, I mean it's obviously mm -hmm. after 10 now, we've been going at this for three and a half hours. Um, yeah. I'd like to try to start and get through things as, you know, as early as makes sense, but, uh, okay. you know, but also give us time to have dinner. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So next 645, next 645 on October 16th is the next meeting. And so once again, Chris, farewell, and mm -hmm. we hope to see you now and then. Thank you. All right. If, any, if anybody else objects, uh, if, un, unless you object, uh, I will say that we are adjourned at six minutes after 10. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all. Hi, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Bye, Chris. See you at the Bye. party. See you Thursday, Chris. Oh. Good night. Good night. Stop recording.